Welcome to the Irish Whiskey Lock-In. It is Friday. It's midnight in Ireland. It's five o'clock somewhere, everywhere. It's uh, almost five o'clock where I am. It's four o'clock in the afternoon in San Diego, uh, and it's seven o'clock Eastern in uh, the East Coast. Uh, you're all very welcome to this week's Irish Whiskey Lock-In. I'm delighted that you're here joining me. We're going to have a great night tonight. Uh, I wait the whole week for this. Let me know where you are and what you're drinking. For those of you who are joining on Instagram, I put up a little bit of a live uh, feed on Instagram as well. But if you want the full experience, do come over to uh, Facebook and YouTube, do a search for Stories and Sips. Uh, we'll be bringing on some special guests there as well to talk to us. So let me know who is joining, where where you are, what are you drinking? Ed is joining us. Good man, Ed Powers, good regular compatriot here in the world of Irish whiskey. Uh, and Greg, thanks for joining us as well. So we're going to have a a good old time tonight. Uh, we'll be drinking some great whiskies. I'll be starting off by drinking the Tullamore Dew single malt 14 year old. We're going to be bringing on a couple of special guests who have far more whiskey knowledge than I do and are going to talk us through uh, some various things from the whiskies that they have to Irish pubs. We're going to do a great rundown on Irish pubs. So I'll give people a couple of minutes to get uh, to join us and then we're going to dive into a little bit of whiskey news from the world of Irish whiskey this week. So good evening to everybody who's joining us, Steve and Greg and Peter and Rob and MP. Uh, it's great to see you all. Julie, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see so many familiar faces. It's been a long week, as all of these weeks are. It feels like it's day 864 of quarantine, of um, self-isolation. And uh, we would all prefer, I think, to be locked into an Irish pub right now. But the sad reality is that the Irish pubs aren't open. We hope that they will be soon. But in the meantime, while they're not open, we're going to be here locking ourselves in to uh, this Irish Whiskey Lock-In live every week on Facebook and YouTube and on Twitter. And uh, we'll do a little bit on Instagram as well. So I'm hoping that you're enjoying it. I'm hoping that it uh, gives you a little bit of distraction from the world that's out there. And uh, we're able to just sit back in our comfortable chair with our nice glass of whiskey and enjoy a bit of crack, a few stories and a few sips about Irish whiskey. So uh, delighted that you're able to accompany me here. I'd say, you know, if nobody turned up here any week, I'd still keep doing it because it's that much fun uh, just talking about the stories and having a few sips. But I'm really delighted to, that so many of you turn up here every week uh, and, and share a, a few drams with me. So good evening to David and Paul and Lorcan and Joe Moore, uh, Matthew and Greg. I'm delighted that you're all here with me. Uh, it is early morning time in Ireland at this stage and fair play to you for, for all coming out. Uh, delighted to see you. And uh, for those of you in uh, the East Coast, it's seven o'clock. So thanks. Thanks for jumping in. So we're going to do uh, I'm going to share a little bit of Irish whiskey news uh, that happened this week. I'm going to try and do this every week. So we get a quick catch up on what's happening in the world of Irish whiskey. As you'd imagine, there's not a whole lot happening right now when many of the distilleries are retooling and are uh, turning their resources to the production of hand sanitizer and the liquids that go into hand sanitizer. So that is a, a very noble contribution from the Irish whiskey industry, from the Irish uh, whiskey world right now, which we're very thankful for. But there was uh, there was a little bit of news this week in the Irish whiskey world. So I am going to uh, share a little bit of that with you. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, I'm going to try and do this every single week. Whatever news happens, if anybody is working in the Irish whiskey industry and wants to send in their news for what's going on, I'll happily share it with you all here on uh, on our lock-in, our weekly lock-in, and let everybody know what's going on. So this week, the news in Irish whiskey is related to Ireland's smallest distillery, and that is Killowen Distillery uh, in, in Northern Ireland. And this week, Killowen released a 10-year-old blended Irish whiskey which is the uh, part of their bonded experimental series. And this whiskey has been finished in a Mexican tequila cask, and it is bottled at 55.4% cask strength. So it's the second 10-year-old blend that has come out of uh, Ireland's smallest distillery. Uh, and it is a small batch, only 388 bottles are available. Cask strength, non-chill filtered, no coloring, 10-year-old blend, uh, and Killowen are doing great things with transparency and making available information about their whiskies that maybe others uh, could could take a leaf out of their book. So it's great to see Brendan Carty in Ireland's smallest distillery uh, doing some fantastic things uh, in the distillery. 
while they're waiting for their own whiskey to age, of course, they're releasing a sourced product, and it is a um, a really interesting one, having a tequila a tequila finish to it. And we're seeing a little bit more of that in the world of whiskey uh, over the past year or so. But it's great to see the second in a uh, ten year old from their experimental series. So uh, kudos to Brendan for releasing uh, this that just uh, was uh, launched, I believe, today. So a little photograph there on the screen of Brendan in the top left hand corner, and then we've got a picture of this world's Ireland's smallest distillery down the bottom left-hand corner. So that is all of the whiskey news, believe it or not, uh, from Ireland this week. So let me go back in here and take this off the screen. So this week as well, uh, I put the call out on Twitter. I put the call out on uh, Facebook, in our Facebook group as well. And I wanted to find out what are Ireland's favorite whiskey pubs, pubs where you'd have a bit of crack, pubs where you would send a good friend to because there's a great whiskey selection, because there are uh, great people to talk to, great characters to meet, something interesting, curious about the place. And boy, did Twitter uh, did Twitter do good. Twitter certainly responded. We had um, hundreds and hundreds of recommendations for pubs all over Ireland. Uh, of course, sadly, right now the pubs are closed while we get through this, uh, this madness and this pandemic. Uh, but when the pubs are open, there is going to be a line around the corner for some of these pubs because they are uh, pieces of Irish history and culture and something very important to us. So um, I put this uh, request up there to tell me what are Ireland's greatest whiskey pubs uh, with no idea what I was going to do when people responded. But it quickly became apparent that this was a list that's worth sharing and it's also a list where we should try and maybe take the top 10 from this list. So I'm going to be joined this evening uh, by a good buddy of mine in the Irish whiskey world who's going to join us, Mark McLaughlin. I'm going to bring him in and he is going to uh, talk with us about Irish pubs as well. Mark, thanks for joining us this evening. Well, Barry, thanks for having me, sir. Good to be here. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm sure we're a few hours away from each other, um, but uh, all, all good, all good. No, I'm delighted that you're able to join us. Mark is a, uh, a whiskey... Uh, aficionado but an oracle of knowledge and mark uh, helped as well with the launch of the uh, irish whiskey distillery section on stories and sips uh, i sent him on uh, the content to review he gave great feedback and input and suggestions on how we might make that a, a, an even greater resource so thanks to mark for that mark for those uh, outside of ireland outside the irish whiskey world who don't know you yet uh, give us a little bit of an understanding of, of who you are and what's your connection to irish whiskey and what you're doing right now um, uh, thanks, Barry. Um, I suppose I've been working with uh, Irish whiskey now for about eight, nine years, kind of constantly, either within the hospitality trade here in Ireland, as in the, the pubs, or um, in I've I've done sales as well uh, with whiskey. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's been a it's been a fun journey. I suppose I got in just about. At the time where it was becoming popular, um, I I worked with the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin for a, a couple of years, and and, and that made things. Uh, uh, I suppose that helped my knowledge to progress a, a massive, massive amount. Uh, I left there to work for Bushmills, which I, I probably left a little bit too early. I wasn't quite ready for the sales role that. that it was with Bushmills and then I bounced about a couple of different whiskey shops. I worked for Mitchell and Sons, uh, the, the founders of uh, Greenspot. I worked for El Mulligan Whiskey Shop for a short period. I worked for High Spirits who are part of uh, Sazerac who own Paddy Irish Whiskey. Um, but recently the last year has been uh, fantastic. I've been working for uh, a real prominent uh, pub group in Dublin called the Chalk Pub Group. You can see Bill Chalk's name there uh, on the on the screen. Um, we have uh, <laughs> we have some of the, I suppose we Charlie, uh, Bill and the, the family uh, have nine pubs uh, here in Ireland, two in Adair and seven in Dublin. Um, we have two fantastic uh, pubs in the city, um, the Bank of Cowes Green. We have an amazing whiskey bar in Searson's um, with some amazing uh, kind of, I suppose, local pubs in Dublin, um, the Orchard, uh, the Drop and Well, the Goat, uh, we have the Oval, we have the Lord Looking, we have a lot of uh, real famous, uh, well-respected Dublin pubs, and then we have the two in Adair, Auntie Venus and, and Bill Chocks. But um, where I met you, Barry, actually the last time uh, in Searson's, uh, as you know, is I suppose that's where our, our whiskey hub is. Um, that's where I suppose we're trying to create an education centre for whiskey. Uh, we're one of the only 
bars in Ireland to have three pot sills in the bar itself. Um, we have two full Middleton collections. We have an amazing selection of Irish whiskey and whiskies from around the world. And we're really pushing things forward. Myself and Bill have kind of taken taking things by the horn and, and really trying to push that. Uh, but not to take away from the Bank and College Green as well in, in the city centre, which is right along the main tourist kind of thoroughfare of Dublin Dame Street. Um, David has an absolutely amazing bar there. Uh, really great selection of Irish whiskey and really highly knowledgeable staff as well. So we're, we're punching above our weight. Um, you, yeah, we met in Searson uh, in November. We, you invited us in for, for a few drinks and to sh show us uh, what you're doing with the Irish whiskey uh, category and how you're promoting it. Are you the only bar in Ireland that's got two entire full collections of Middleton from 1984 all the way up to 2019? I reckon we're the only bar in the world that probably has two. Um, you know, there, we were. I, I don't think Searsons was the first to have a full Middleton collection. They might have been. There was a few around the same time that put them all together. And I suppose they were. I suppose the kind of preeminent collecting whiskey bars, um, where they were putting things on display. But we see Searsons very much as kind of the home of Middleton, and uh, we. Uh, I think when when other people started to have full sets, I know the Palace Bar, um, with Stephen McGuinness, my best friend, I could see him commenting there. He, he put one together for the Palace Bar a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, there was rumours of other ones popping up. I know the Sonny Malloy's and Galway got one shortly after that, and I, I think Bill... And, uh, and Charlie really wanted, I suppose, to solidify themselves above the rest, and, and they managed to put together the second one, um, which was uh, which was was pretty cool. So um, yeah, it's it's nice. There's only uh, I suppose Searsons Searsons actually has their their own single cask, Middleton single cask, and they're currently the only actually on trade premises outside of five star hotels that have a, a Middleton single cask, and it's it's the oldest one. It's it's a twenty eight year old. Um, and it's a bottle of cast strength. It's you know it's a fantastic whiskey. It's it's uh, it's it's incredibly expensive. It's it's rare. It's it's got everything that you could want. It's an iconic dram, if you get me. Um, and I think again that was really serious and solidifying itself as as one of the homes of Middleton. So I see, I see you're doing quite right before the the doors uh, had to close there temporarily. Uh, we're sure you were doing great things with tasting nights and uh, uh, doing full ranges like from the full Middleton range or not the Middleton range but maybe the Redbreast range the the yeah. um um, I saw the Napog Castle range as well that you were yeah. sharing. I think the the, the thing uh, what we've been trying to do with whiskey tastings and what and what Bill's been trying to do is give the uh, give tastings that are um, you know I suppose that appeal to the the novice but also uh, will have something there that's. Um, that will appeal to the connoisseur as well. Um, we, we base a lot of our tastings around education. So it's, um, it's a, I think one of the advantages we have is we can bring somebody in from a brand to talk about their whiskey and talk about it through, I suppose, through their eyes and maybe through their, their marketing and what they've maybe been told to say. Um, but we will always have somebody there, whether it be myself or Bill or whether it be one of the young lads like Ryan. Um, they're there to, I suppose, give a, give everybody a little insight into the way we view whiskey from the outside perspective. So I think that's what makes Searsons unique, you know, so. I love the focus on Irish whiskey, an old established bar that is not set in its ways, is it, uh, is embracing the new as well in a, in a fantastic old kind of Victorian uh, setting as well. Siobhan uh, Coslo, who we both know, has reminded us to tell everybody what's in our glass right now. In the yeah, yeah. You on, I forgot to ask what's in your glass. Well, I, I'm drinking a Cherconnell 10 year old Madeira cask. Um, I th and the reason why I picked this one actually tonight is because um, we're talking about whiskey uh, and whiskey bars. And I was thinking, what was the first whiskey that I tried in a whiskey bar? And it was it was Turkonal Ten Madeira, and it was because in, in the first ever Irish Whiskey Awards, it won Irish Whiskey of the Year. And uh, I thought, you know what, that's what I'll have in my glass tonight. And I'm drinking out of a, a, a wee crystal Glencairn that I robbed from a Highland Park box in the Celtic whiskey shop about four or five years ago. So if Ali ever sees this, that's where his glass is. Where glass, they know where it's gone. But, you know, and these uh, live streams are recorded. So if he ever wants evidence for the court case, uh, he yeah. has it, which is perfect. Um, and then I've got in my glass, I've got a uh, Tullamore Dew, 14 year old single malt. Uh, quadruple finished in terms of a uh, finished in four different casks old bourbon oloroso sherry 
port and Madeira. So I have this and I have it in a glass that I didn't steal. I have it in a glass that I purchased uh, for real money uh, to a glass. And um, I'm enjoying this 14 year old single malt, uh, which um, John Quinn from Tullamore Jew was kind enough to send our way for a little tasting. So everyone else who's joining us tonight, I'm delighted that you're here. There's more than 100 across the different streams uh, are joining us currently. And I know that tends to go up as the night goes on. Uh, share with us what you're drinking, what's in your glass, where are you joining us from? We'd love to give you a shout out as well. And if you've got any questions for Mark, he has worked in some amazing places. Uh, any questions on what's in your own glass? Um, for anything that we're not able to answer, there'll be others on the stream here who'll be able to answer that as well. Mark has a tremendous knowledge on uh, Irish whiskey. So we're going to uh, dive into having a bit of crack for a little bit on these 10 pubs out of the 150, 200 pubs that came up in this list that would be good pubs to recommend somebody to go to, to hang out, to drink a bit of whiskey, to meet a few characters. We managed to whittle it down to five each, and we were comparing notes earlier and laughing at the different pubs that um, that, that we've selected. But um, I'm really interested to get people's thoughts on these pubs and to weigh in. And let, let us know in the comments if you've been to these pubs. Are there others that we've missed? I'm sure there are, because we can only choose 10, or we'd be here the whole night. Um, but we're going to dive into uh, 10 amazing pubs and have a bit of an old chat about them, talk about their whiskey, and talk about the characters. So, Mark, why don't you start with the first one that you pulled out and that you've recommended? Um, well, I think the, f the first one that I picked out there, um, well, and I suppose I'll start at the start of my career. I've picked out two, two whiskey bars that uh, I actually previously had the pleasure of working in. Um, and uh, I suppose these are the bars that got me into whiskey. So the, the first bar that I've uh, nominated for our list is uh, Garavan's Bar in Galway. Um, not Caravan's Bar or not Garvin's. It's, uh, it's definitely Garavan's Bar. Um, I, I suppose when I, I did my uh, university degree uh, in, in the NUI Galway, so the National University of Ireland down in Galway, I did a degree in English and maths. I wanted to be a secondary school teacher, but I didn't do well enough in the degree to get my dip, as it's called here. Um, and I, I was working in uh, actually the Keys Bar in Galway at the time, full time anyway, um, as a glass collector uh, uh, and general skiffy, I suppose. I did back bar, I did cleaning, I did, I did a bit of everything. Um, but when I when I finished my degree, I, uh, I I knew the guy that was managing Garvin's. He was a guy called Brian Taylor at the time. And I, I had gone into to Brian a, a couple of months beforehand and said, listen, when the summer comes, pal, I want to get a job out of you. you know, I, I, I'm sick of collecting glasses. I want to work behind the bar in a really traditional Irish pub. And Garvin's was definitely a traditional Irish pub. It was very small. It was a former spirits grocer, uh, which meant uh, essentially that in previous years, it, it was a small little bar on one side. And on the other side, there was a, a kind of general store where you could pick up and uh, they eventually I suppose the grocer cro closed I think in the, uh, it was the early either the 70s it could have been the early 90s I think it was uh, well it was definitely the early 90s when they knocked the wall in and made the bar slightly bigger but the capacity of this bar would be only about I suppose 100 people maybe a, a few more um, but I said to Brian I'm coming so the day I finished my uh, my exams, I, I got my shirt on and I had printed off a CD and I, I was going to go in and I was going to ask for a job in Garvin's. And as I was on the way in, actually, my phone rang and it was Brian. And he said, could you come in and do a trial tonight in Garvin's? So I actually never got to bring my CD in. Um, but Garvin's, uh, I suppose, it, what was interesting about my time in Garvin's was they had 56 Irish whiskies when I started there. Um, so they were just starting off on kind of their journey to becoming a, a great Irish whiskey bar. And this was very much championed by the owner, Paul Garvin. Now, Paul's family purchased Garvin's in 1937. Um, his father was the custodian of a uh, charity Garvin for a very, very long time. And Paul now is the custodian of it himself. And I say custodian because he doesn't work in the bar himself. He, he has many, many other businesses, but his offices are actually just above the pub itself. And that's how I got to kind of know Paul. And that's how I, I started to get into whiskey because Paul used to have um, every Tuesday and Wednesday night, he had some businesses in, 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 in some business in America that he uh, he had to do. So on a Tuesday night, he would come in just like this at midnight and do a conference call to America. Um, and after the conference call, I'd be closing the bar. There'd be nobody there. I'd just be cleaning up downstairs and he would bring down whatever whiskey he had purchased that week. So I was there for two years and between 
that time he went from having 56 whiskies to 175 Irish whiskies. And every juicy or Wednesday night, he would bring these whiskies down to me and he would tell me where he bought them, what auction or what site that he sourced them from, why he sourced them. And he started to tell me little stories about them. And that's, that's, I suppose, how I got into whiskey. But I suppose why I would put them on this list is because they've really, they've taken it, the bull by the horns. And I honestly think they're one of the best expressions of a whiskey bar. The first thing that they did, I suppose, was they wanted to create something that would draw people in. So he came to us. We were we were the bar staff, and he says, "Listen, we're going to do Irish coffees right." And I personally think that the Irish coffee is the most important Irish whiskey drink that there is. I think there's no excuse for any bar not to do them. I think we as Garavans should be, uh, or we as as Irish people and Irish pubs should be championing the Irish coffee. And he said, we're going to do them right. We're going to make them this way. And he had somebody in from Powers at the time to make one for us. And we learned how to make it. And he said, but we're, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to make our stand out. So he showed us he had a plate that said Garavan's Bar on it. He had a glass that said Garavan's Bar on it. And he had a spoon with a little bend that hung off the side of the glass that said Garavan's Bar on it. And he says, I'm going to get these and this is how we're going to serve it. And it looked amazing. And less than a week later, about a thousand sp- or 10,000 spoons arrived, a thousand glasses, a thousand plates. He was going full hell for leather on this. And then the next, after we'd solidified ourselves as one of the best Irish coffees in Galway, he was, now we need to take the whiskey to the next level. So he started doing whiskey flights. And the thing about the whiskey flights was the next delivery that arrived was Glencairn glasses. And it was Glencairns that were branded Garavans again. We now had a nosing glass. We had a proper whiskey tasting glass. And he felt that was very important that if somebody ordered a Jameson or a, or a, you know, a Tullamore Dew or a standard Irish whiskey, they would get it in a rocks glass. They would be offered water or whatever they want on the side or ice, whatever they needed. We would never tell anybody how they drink whiskey. Um, but then when they ordered a premium whiskey, they would get a Glencairn, a branded Glencairn. The next thing that he did was whiskey tasting flights, and he had, I think he had four flights at the time. But the cool thing about when you order a fl- flight in Garvin's was you would get the flight, the three whiskeys, but you would also get a parchment envelope with parchment tasting notes inside of the whiskey itself. Because the bar was so small, there was only ever two staff there. So you didn't always get a chance to talk to the customers or give the customers the real full-on Irish whiskey experience. But by giving them these tasting notes that they could take home and a little bit of a spiel and a little bit of uh, everything, Garvin was really, really building his brand that way. And it made them stand out. And I think they've won the Irish Whiskey Bar of the Year in Connacht the last six years running. And in 2017, they won the overall award. So uh, a really great bar. I don't know if you've been there, have you? I have. I have. I've been there many times. I was there in November uh, before Whiskey Live, brought a few friends from from America into Garvin's, showed them the old cabinet to the left of the bar with that old, the old Jameson yeah. there and the old whiskeys that uh, are not, re- not, not for sale. But uh, I encourage them to go up to the bar and, ask about Irish whiskey and to be yeah. fair they did and the staff there were able to make recommendations recommended a Powers John's Lane for a friend of mine which of course is a great recommendation any day of the week so Garavans is a great spot I love I love going in there it's hard to narrow in on just one bar in Galway but you, you've done well to choose choose Garavans there so anyone yeah. who's heading to Galway drop it drop into Garavans the, the one the one thing that we, I suppose we, we'll touch on a lot over this conversation is is uh, whiskey or memorabilia and Garvin's is a bar that has a lot of memorabilia there and they have a lot of rare whiskies but the actual memorabilia in there more so is actually stuff from the old spirits grocer they actually mm. have tables that swivel that have the old uh, ledgers embedded into them with a glass cover so you can turn the table around as you're drinking and you can read the ledgers everybody at the yeah, table can read which, which is really is a really cool touch but uh, yeah really great bar great bar great great first choice um I'm going to choose one now. I'm going to go a little bit further south. Let me type it in here to bring it up. We're going to go down to the southwest uh, coast of Ireland, maybe the uh, the pub furthest west in Ireland, furthest west in Europe. We're talking, of course, of Dick Max Pub in Dingle, the famous Dick Max. It it wouldn't be a a whiskey list, a whiskey pub list without mentioning Dick Max. Uh, Many is the night I've got lost in there, couldn't find the door no matter how hard I tried uh, and didn't want to. Uh, until I was dragged out uh, much later in the night. But Dick Max is a, a remarkable spot. Uh, of course, the magical town of Dingle, which to me just always holds a magical place in my heart. But Dick Max has this wonderful selection from the ceiling practically to the floor of every bottle of wh- Irish whiskey you've ever seen at 
very affordable prices to be able to try so many different whiskies by the measure. Um, you go in there during the day and there's 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 a man working leather. He's making belts and wallets for you. He'll fix your boots if you want to. And then you come back at night or you stay there the whole day and you'll just sip whiskey and you wouldn't know who you'd run into or you wouldn't know what kind of characters you'd meet. And it's one of those old Irish pubs that it both hasn't changed, but has also uh, met the needs of what people are looking for today. Like the, uh, Finn, the, who runs the bar uh, at the moment, uh, he has built a brewery out the back. He's got Big Max Brewery. Uh, he's also built a gym where he spends most of the time uh, lifting his weights down the back garden there. But between the pub and the brewery and that outside kind of a food court area, kind of a food truck area, it's a, on a summer's day, I don't know that there's anywhere better to be than Dick Max and Dingle. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'll be bold enough to say that Finn is probably the best looking barman in Ireland. <laughs> Tall, blonde, he's got the muscles, he's got everything we we, we aspire to. Um, but uh, Dick, Dick Max is is something else. It's uh, it's it's almost an institution now among among the whiskey enthusiasts of Ireland, especially. Um, Finn's done a great job in building a real community uh, down there uh, w- w- that really does involve people from all around the world. Once you've been to Dick Mac once, you really do feel like you're part of its story. The Brew House was an absolutely fantastic addition and a, and an amazing. Um, I suppose pushing forward of Dingle itself and pushing forward his brand and, and really making it making it more, um, I suppose, part of uh, the Wild Atlantic Way, making it more p- part of, um, I suppose, the Irish drinks industry. It's really, it, it's really a destination now down there. Um, and now, they're doing uh, collaborations like with, uh, they're doing collaborations with with Walsh Whiskey, uh, releasing yeah. their their own bottlings, which yeah. uh, they're doing for the second time this year, which is fantastic to see as well. Yeah, they've they've got some really good relationships down there. I, I don't know if you know him, but there's a, a gent called Peter White who's yeah. very very much involved with the Irish Whiskey Society and has been for a long time. But he uh, he used to come into the Celtic Whiskey Shop years ago uh, when we were working there, uh, buying bottles uh, for taking down to Dingle, and he was always talking about this uh, chap Finn that he was bringing the bottles to. Um, but then he started bringing bottles to all the other pubs as well, and. Uh, Peter and, and Finn, Finn would say himself, Peter Peter was very much the catalyst in kind of the Irish whiskey uh, renaissance in Dick Max. And uh, at, the, at the beginning, they had a, an awful, a real kind of wide variety of whiskies from all around. Uh, they had a massive selection of scotch. It was amazing. A load of uh, single casts from the likes of Glendronic and Ben Reik and did some really uh, great Japanese whiskies. Uh, but I, th- I think I th- the last time I was down there, I noticed that there was a lot more Irish now and, and they're starting to push that way. Um, I know they were putting in an Irish coffee hub for this uh, this kind of tourist season this summer and, and next winter, and hopefully they get the chance to open and really kind of uh, explore that and explore the new horizons. One thing about Finn is he's young and he'll he'll push the bar forward. That's right. That's right. Again, multiple winner of Irish whiskey bar of the year, and you really can't refute it. It's, it's no, well, uh, well and we're going to see more from them. But put Dick Max in your list. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't see it earlier in my life. I waited until I was in my late 30s to ever see Dick Max, and I wasted the first 30-something years of my life. So go to Dick Max uh, when you get a chance. So uh, third on the list. So what's next up for you, Mark? I think, uh, is it the Palace Bar, Barry? Uh, 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 A bar that we're very, very fond of, both of us. Um, So the the Palace is... uh, I suppose it's a bar that I'm incredibly fond of. When I first came to Dublin and first started working with Stephen and and Derek and James and Emmett in the in the Celtic whiskey shop, um, there was one publican that was one publican out of more so than anybody else that was always coming through the doors, and that was Willie Ahern. And Willie ha- at that stage had already solidified himself as the Irish whiskey bar. Um, he he had started it long before anybody else, and he was. Uh, he, he really was kind of just a real advocate for, for Irish whiskey. He wanted to have everything. He, he just, he, if there was a new product out there, he was the first person you could go to and guarantee a new listing. And it was great because for, for brands, this is, this is around kind of 
I suppose 2000, 2011, 2012, kind of 13, 14, when a lot of, of these independently bottled brands were coming around that were, uh, some have done well, some have disappeared. Um, some are really solidified brands like Walsh Whiskey, like Writer's Tears and Irishman. They knew when they had a new whiskey coming out that they could walk through the door of the Palace Bar and he would guarantee to stock it, which was amazing because that was a that was an outlet that really wasn't around before that. I got to know Willie um, through the Celtic Whiskey Shop and one day myself and Stephen and a few others, I think we're in the bar having a few pints and Willie said, he said, yeah, you know, we have the Whiskey Palace upstairs and they converted the old uh, living quarters where his grandfather would have lived uh, and his father would have grown up uh, into a, a bar. And he says he, they turned it into this amazing little 40-seater uh, whiskey bar, just a whiskey little heaven. I know you've been there, Barry. But um, he said, we, we have it up there and it's really not utilised. We don't have anybody up there that knows enough about whiskey. Would you know anybody that you know would be looking to do a few hours or, or, or could bring something along? And I said, geez, Willie, I do. Um, I'd love to do a few hours for you. You know, I was just after buying a car and I, I needed a few extra pounds. So I started working uh, in the palace uh, every Thursday and every Sunday night, specifically in the upstairs whiskey palace. And uh we, I suppose, I, I, I worked there for about a year, I think it was, and, and it was just a phenomenal experience. Working in the Whiskey Palace, especially, you're talking, like, you, this place, you, you put 30 people in there and it's busy. Um, um, and in the winter, especially, uh, or in the quieter days, like the Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, if you got the right crowd in there, you could be behind the bar, almost storytelling all night long. You could have every person in the room looking at you and you could really, you could be selling loads of whiskey, which I did. And, uh, you could really be giving them an experience, which is amazing. But the downstairs bar is, you know, on the walls, there's some of the most, uh, pristine uh, Irish whiskey mirrors that you will see, you know, that cost an absolute fortune, probably. Um, he does have that full Middleton collection um, in there, which is superb. He is, one of, he is one of the most perfect DWD, original DWD bottles right behind the bar beside the bust of Con Hulin, who is a famous sports writer in Ireland, uh, behind the bar, which is amazing. He's some, he's some great relics. Um but it's 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 long, it's narrow, it, it's got the most amazing little snug. It's just an absolutely uh, super, it's superior. It's an amazing traditional Victorian Irish pub. And if you get the chance to sit down with Willie, he's one of the he's one of the nicest men in whiskey. Um, his wife Miriam as well is an absolute superstar. And uh, uh, I I can't wait for the past bar to open again. I really so, can't. Requests for some of these. So people know what they look like. Uh, this is the outside of the Palace Bar. We'll we'll try and throw a few of these up as we speak about them. Uh, but the Palace Bar is a remarkable spot. And uh, when you're uh, when you're hitting when you're hitting up Dublin, so I know we've got a long list of whis of uh, whis yeah, we're, we're speed it up here. <laughs> but we'll try and squeeze them all in, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, I had one question uh, that came in here. Actually, no, I didn't. We'll come back to those. But for anyone who is just joining. Um, we are. I'm talking with uh, Mark McLaughlin, who is a uh, has had tremendous experience in the whiskey business in Ireland. And if you are thinking he has worked in every uh, whiskey pub and uh, premises and retailer in Ireland, you'd be absolutely mm -hmm. right. It is his life goal to work in all of them? I think <laughs> here. So uh, a, a remarkable knowledge that um, that you're bringing to the table, uh, Mark. So the next on the list, we could talk all night about the Palace Bar, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pull one from my list now, and, and I'm gonna go. Uh, south down the country again down to my neck of the woods and i'm going to type it up here it is well known to people in cork and it is drum roll shelburne the shelburne bar in cork and the shelburne is a um, fantastic pub it is on mccurtain street in cork uh, and I went in there for the first time last year, and a great team in there, Mark Lonergan, Mark, Mark Lonergan and his team do a remarkable job, incredible whiskey knowledge. It's the kind of place where you'd walk in, and on first glance, you wouldn't realize it's a whiskey pub. And then they hand you the menu, and it is as thick as a Bible and as heavy as one. And you you will find every whiskey that has ever been produced in Ireland in that, in that list. And many of these whiskeys are locked away in cabinets all around the walls of the bar. Uh, but no matter what you order, they'll happily oblige and go out and get that in the in the cabinets. Remarkable um, selection, 
remarkable knowledge. Uh, you talk about Irish coffees earlier, uh, Mark. Uh, the Shelburne prides themselves on their Irish coffee. Uh, and I may be mistaken, but I do believe that they recently won a, a coffee, Irish coffee making uh, contest with, with, with Paddy, did they? With Paddy Whiskey? I, they, they did, but it was only because I didn't enter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually another Donny Goldman that wanted to. Um, the the Shelburne again. I, I met Philip Gillivan, the the proprietor. Of the Shel- Shelburne um, uh, must be seven eight years ago now. Mark was working there. Mark Lonergan and a guy called Stephen Hackett, who has another lovely little bar down in Cork. The the name it's, it's Nana is actually it's called. I thought the name was going to get away from me there. But the three lads together, Philip, Mark, and Stephen, they were really getting into Irish whiskey. And uh, they they really, I mean, I've never seen somewhere like jump head first into it like those guys. They really, they went for it. They had me down, uh, giving them training, uh, you know, really going through the basics, you know, the four styles of Irish whiskey. They wanted to understand exactly, you know, I suppose the, what, what whiskey bars kind of should do and need to do is really... Uh, you know, set out that baseline of knowledge, and they understood that. That if we, if everybody on our staff understand what the four styles of Irish whiskey are, you know, single pot still, single malt, single grain, and blended whiskey, and we can impart some of that little bit of knowledge on our on our uh, consumers, and we will really hit the ground running. And they did, and they've moved from there now. So Mark's knowledge is absolutely outstanding. Uh, I hear your man Rory is absolutely fantastic. Um, I I was down. I think the last time I was down there was about eighteen months ago at an absolutely amazing time drank far too many uh whiskeys had a heap of guinness left and came back again it's it's a hard place to leave it's it's a it's a really phenomenal pub and it's a i suppose it's a testament to to that side of cork you know that mccurtain street is just across the river where which i i suppose might have been a no man's land a lot long time ago but they yeah, have them, yeah. they have them they have themselves there now in cask across the road one of ireland's kind of premier cocktail bars right. they're doing well. right. Yeah, Siobhan Costello mentions that they, they're the Guinness Book of Record title holder for the most Irish coffees made under three minutes, which is a fantastic uh, accolade. Yeah, Cork is uh, undergoing a resurgence in uh, on the craft cocktail side. Cork, of course, a spiritual home, an ancestral home of Irish whiskey. Uh, I had a, the chance to sit down with um, Eric Ryan from the Cork Whiskey Society. Yeah, fantastic. The Cork Whiskey Walk. And a, who is a distiller also uh, in the Middleton Distillery. And we talked for about an hour and a half this week on his, the history of Cork whiskey. His whiskey walks, uh, his whiskey tours end at the Shelburne for an Irish coffee, uh, as they should do. But uh, for those of you who are interested in Cork history, of uh, whiskey history in Cork, uh, this Wednesday I'll be releasing uh, an episode of Stories and Sips with my, my chat with Eric, which is a really fascinating deep dive. And we do mention uh, the Shelburne as well. So the Shelburne right. is up there. Um, Mark, I believe we're going north of the border for the uh, for the next one, uh, the jerk music. Yeah, when when uh, when we were looking through that list of, of I suppose that nearly 150, 200 plus pubs that were in there, there was a lot uh, in and around Belfast. I seen the Crown mentioned. I seen Biddles Bar mentioned, and Biddles is an absolutely fantastic bar. John Biddles is a great advocate for Irish whiskey. Famously, the bar that uh, had the broken bottle of Middleton Pearl. Uh, which was knocked over uh, by a, a, um, I suppose it was a construction worker, um, and uh, Belfast is really quickly becoming, um, I suppose, really a hub of hospitality and greatness in Ireland. And uh, if you work in Ireland, like like we do, especially in the whiskey industry, there's no borders. It's it's very much it's it's all island, and and we look at it that way. Um, but. Uh, I think if you, if you go to Belfast, there's one bar that you absolutely must visit, and it's the Duke of York. And the Duke of York, uh, why I picked the Duke of York is is because I suppose with every every pub that we've been talking about, we're very much talking about the people behind the pub and the man uh, behind the Duke of York, the Heart Bar, the Friend at Hand Whiskey Shop, the, the Dark Horse, the the New Orpheum Room, uh, Orpheus Room should say the you know Willie Jack. Is, is one of those people that will go down as probably a silent legend of the Irish whiskey industry. He's been collecting Irish whiskey and Irish whiskey memorabilia for over 30 years, probably 40 years now, himself and his wife, Joanne. 
And, you know, they've been traveling to auctions. They've been going all around Ireland and uh, probably elsewhere as well. And they just have built this phenomenal, phenomenal uh, collection of stuff. When you're sitting in the back room in the Duke of York having a dram and looking at all the mirrors, it's outstanding. But then you can go across the road to the Heart Bar, which has display cabinets in there with anything and everything that Dunville's ever produced, which obviously is a brand that is becoming incredibly popular now through Jardith and the team in Ecklinville. Um, and you, you'll see many other brands. And two years ago, um, he opened his whiskey shop, The Friend at Hand. Um, he created, uh, I suppose, a museum of Belfast distilling history above the shop. So anybody that's been into the shop and hasn't been to the second floor needs to go to the second floor. Uh, but down below uh, on the main floor, you, you'll see shelves just packed full of whiskey history and most of the shelves say not for sale or never for sale never never for sale and never 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 for sale um but he's another guy that's uh, through the friend at hand he has his friend at hand 13 year old bottling series he's he's, he's released 13 uh, he's going to release 13 single casks um all with a different story and the stories are, are all true which he's created himself and uh he uh you know he's on I think cast nine now he has a power single cask as well a 14 year old he has a 25 year old red breast single cask and I think he's a 20 year old Middleton as well but I suppose just to, I know I'm talking a wee bit too long about him but what he has done there in the commercial court in Belfast it's just around the corner from the Merchant Hotel is he's created this little hub of I suppose uh, Belfast and Irish whiskey history, and he, he keeps he keeps buying buildings and and renovating and making his his premises bigger, but also uh, creating new venues just to keep the likes of the Starbucks and the McDonald's of the world out of that street. Um, he's really he, he he is he's an advocate for Belfast, an advocate for the commercial court, and uh, he's just he, he's a guy that very very few people know about. Um, but he, he will go down in history. And now his right-hand man, Paul O'Hare, deserves a mention as well because he's the guy that puts a lot of it together for him. So, great place. You could be organ. I'm not having a chance to be yet. I'll bring, you, I'll bring you there the next time you're over. <laughs> Here, one of you heard, heard Mark promise it. So I'm going to go uh, down, back down to the kingdom in Kerry for my next... Uh, choice. Uh, it is not uh, a traditionally thought of whiskey pub, but it's one I think that deserves a, a special mention. Uh, and let me type in here uh, up on the screen. So we're going to go down to Kerry and we are going to go to Listole in County Kerry. And we are going to the famous John B. Keen's uh, pub in Listole in County Kerry. And um, let me pull up a picture of um, John B. Keen's up here for you. Uh, it's a little bit of a blurry image there. So John B. Keynes uh, is, uh, there you go again. Uh, John B. Keen uh, was a famous playwright, uh, a writer, a, a wit, a, a, a author, a playwright, and a publican in Ireland in, 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 in County Kerry. This was his pub in County Kerry. Uh, a very well-known man uh, wrote the, the play that became the movie The Field, and he is a legend in uh, Kerry and a legend in Ireland. And why I bring up uh, John B. Keane as a particular uh, whiskey pub is that John B. Keane had a love for whiskey, a graw, as we'd say in Irish, for whiskey. And he famously uh, loved the plop of the whiskey into the bottom of his glass. And he spoke about it with reverence. And why I love this particular pub and this particular story is that Ireland and whiskey pubs and the community that's built up are built around stories. And John B. Keane was a storyteller. And uh, after John B. Keane passed away, his son was famously uh, interviewed and um, he was asked, um, what is the, the legacy of, of his father? And what do you think that he contributed? And his son mentioned that. He said he was an incredible businessman. He said he, he'll long be remembered as a storyteller, uh, but he was a, a very clever businessman, or as they say in Kerry, a cute whore, uh, somebody who could uh, turn any situation to their advantage. And his son mentioned how um, his father opened the pub and he'd sell the locals their pints and their whiskey, and they'd pay him for those pints and their whiskey. And the more they paid, the more they drank, of course. And as they drank, they'd tell John B. Keane their stories, the stories from their farms and their families and from the hills and the mountainsides of Kerry. And John would write down these stories. And then he'd go away and he'd write his plays and his books. And then they'd be turned into stage adaptations or they'd be turned into, into books. And then he'd sell the books 
back to the people in his bar. So not only did they give him the stories, they paid for the pints and then they paid for the stories to be given back to them again. And I think that's a uniquely Irish thing. And he has a, a special place in my heart. I met him one time. Uh, funny that we have this connection, Mark, actually, because it was in in, in Chalks in Adair uh, in Limerick oh, that I met wow. John Dean about five years before he passed away. And uh, I, I was a young... 18 year old uh, a gossour, and I worked up the courage to go up to John B. Keane and shake his hand and just say, I just wanted to shake your hand. That's all. Thanks very much. And then scurry that's away again. That's <laughs> brilliant. That's, that's a story. Now. That's a story. Um, just uh, I suppose before we go on to the next one, I've noticed in the comments there that uh, we're, we're graced with the presence of Middleton Master Blender Billy Lytton, uh, or Billy Lighton, should I say, and he's celebrating his uh, 33rd wedding anniversary. Oh. So I'm going to toast him now with a red breast single cask um, from the Celtic whiskey shop. Um, given given that, uh, I suppose, we're all in quarantine here in Ireland and in the, I suppose, the age of drinking responsibly, I'm using a measure to make sure I don't drink too much. Um, a good healthy measure, though. Happy anniversary. <laughs> um, That's amazing. But, uh, uh, I'll, I'll have a drop of Billy's whiskey too while we're at it. I'll, I'll right. have a Billy, of your, your Dreamcast 20-year-old, I'll pour a drop into my glass as well. Fantastic. Um, and again, I, I see all the comments here. It's it's absolutely fantastic to see so many people uh, listening to us here and I hope you're enjoying the chat so far. But yeah, here's a drop of Redbreast to, to Billy and his wife. Um, Billy, happy yeah. anniversary, folks, and it's, it's uh, like great to have you. Cheers. Happy anniversary. Mm. Right. Thanks to Quivine there for sharing the exact quote that I was referencing from John B. Keane. It's a classic. I love the plop of whiskey into a glass. I love it. I love to listen to it. I love to see the cream on a pint. I love the first violent, powerful impact of a glass of whiskey when I throw it back in me. That is John B. Keane. That's a storyteller right there. Thanks, Quivine, for sharing it. Uh, Slaunt to Billy from everybody here as well, uh, from Peter. Uh, and from uh, Jeff in Indiana, they're pouring a dram of the Redbreast 27. And I know that Lovely. Jeff is off and opening that. <laughs> Great stuff. There's it. Connor Ryan's looking to see the measure. Is that healthy enough for you, Paul? Over a cup. <laughs> well, that's great news. Um, and thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to move on to the next one in our yeah. list. So I, I, I picked this one because I wanted to, I suppose I wanted to bring, we're talking about a, an awful lot of old school bars and I wanted to kind of highlight one of the new school, one of the brand new bars uh, of Dublin again, as I'm based in Dublin and uh, just uh, give a, I suppose a tip of the hat to the innovation is there, uh, that is there and uh, I suppose what uh, they're doing for, and not so much, well, so much the Irish whiskey industry, but also the Irish spirits industry and that's bar 1660. Um, here in Dublin. Um, now, Bar 1661 would be, I suppose, very much a cocktail bar. Um, it's one of the finest venues you will see, and uh, it's own, owned uh, and run by uh, a gent called Dave Mulligan. And Dave is the guy uh, behind Bon Pochin. And uh, he's, I suppose, been the real catalyst in the pot chain uh, revolution in Ireland. And he's a guy that is, uh, I suppose, pushing the boundaries of, of where pot chain stands and where it can be globally as well. Um, he's a great, great guy. Uh, that's a lovely photo there of the interior of the bar. Uh, all the woodwork, et cetera, was done on site. Uh, by a local Dublin uh, company, um, it's phenomenal. Now, I suppose why I wanted to touch on these guys uh, is because they've uh, an amazing selection of spirits there. They've an amazing bar team. They've some incredibly talented bartenders working there. They've uh, well, G Gillian Boyle's just left them, but an outstanding uh, female Irish talent uh, and a powerhouse within the spirits industry in Ireland. Gillian, uh, Alan McGillivray, who's formerly of the Dead Rabbit and Blacktail in New York, so has worked in the best cocktail bars in the world. And they've Havana and Luke as well working there under Dave, which is is amazing. Now they're doing things like whiskey. Wednesdays where they're getting brands involved to host master classes every Wednesday for a month. Um, they're doing uh, bourbon and blues on Monday nights where they're again encouraging people to drink whiskey. Um, they've created a potching cocktail called the Belfast Coffee, which is essentially a cold brew Irish coffee with using potching, and it's really it's become a welcome drink. It's it's actually it's going on to the new menu in Searsons where we're gonna we're gonna do it alongside our Irish coffee as uh, something that is. Uh, uh, 
absolutely, I suppose they're, they're setting a standard. Um, but uh, it's it's something that's, I suppose, really, really special. Um, it's a brand new bar. I, I, I can't imagine what they're doing at the minute or what they're going through because um, I, I assume that they're paying rent. You know, they're just they're just gone their first year anniversary and to get hit by something like this pandemic, which has closed them down. Um, I, I really hope that they would get through. But what they've done is they've, they've innovated. They're selling bottled cocktails here and apparently doing very well. And just today they launched uh, the 1661 Dream Drams where they're selling drams of whiskey from their collection for uh, outrageous prices to be honest and uh, people are, are really going for that so uh, through this they've, they've always been innovating and it's 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 really it's a it's it's in a spot where it's it's kind of it's slightly off the beaten track in Dublin in that it's about five minutes further than anywhere else that you would recommend. Um, but it's well worth the walk, and uh, it's their drinks. You know they're experimenting with whiskey highballs. They're doing potching cocktails. It's it really is. It's it's a it's a glass apart to quote uh, Fiona O'Connor. Uh, it's a great bar. Is and uh, they're doing really interesting things and uh, bringing, like you said, Puccina, uh, uh, old spirit into the, the modern era and doing great yeah. things with their, their Belfast and coffee. I, that they make I, yeah, their- just to say, 1661, where does that come from? That was the year that uh, I suppose the selling was made illicit in Ireland, so it was essentially the year that Puccina was banned. Um, so, Bon Puccina, 1661, it all, it all comes together. Um, if you're in Dublin, go to uh, Bar 1661. We are going to go down the country, down to the uh, southeast, uh, for the next of our whiskey bars that we're going to recommend that you, on your travels, when the doors open up again, that you go hit them up. I know a lot of our audience who are joining us tonight are from across the pond where I am in the United States. Uh, I hope you're taking notes of these bars. Because they're amazing bars that will welcome you, and if you let them know that you're coming in advance, they'll roll out the red carpet for you because they love Irish whiskey bars. Uh, we're going to go down the country for the next one, and it is a fantastic whiskey bar that has done amazing things for um, for uh, whiskey, and that is the Dillon Whiskey Bar in um, in Kilkenny. Let me edit that. It is the Dillon Whiskey Bar uh, in Kilkenny, and they are um, have been uh, doing tremendous things to showcase Irish whiskey and build community around Irish whiskey. And uh, Mark, we were chatting before we came on. At- yeah. Dillon Whiskey Bar has been instrumental in the uh, the growth and the fostering of the Kilkenny Whiskey Guild, uh, a very important uh, co- community initiative amongst whiskey fans down in Kilkenny, haven't they? Yeah, well, uh, I think the the Dillon and, and Betty Early's next door was, uh, uh, you know, they're they're run by a guy called uh, Jim Rafferty and. Uh, Jim, again, saw the potential in Irish whiskey and saw the potential in being a little bit different. And Kilkenny is an amazing town to visit. And I I, I don't know their numbers for tourists, but I'm, I'm certain sure they get a hell of a amount of tourism over the year. And uh, he, he kind of pushed it forward. And he got a very interesting young guy called uh, Chris Hennessy working for him. And Chris is... Yeah, you, you called me an oracle of Irish whiskey there at the start. My knowledge is is uh, my knowledge, I suppose, is good, and it's uh, it's probably it's it's very uh, uh, fact based and whatnot. But Chris just dives into the history more than anybody else, and uh, he's uh, he he actually owns that Irish whiskey page on Facebook, um, and he, he does great work there as well. Um, but between himself and Jim and then the likes of Eddie Langton and the guys in Paris, Texas and, and the numerous other bars that are in the Kilkenny Whiskey Guild, they came together using an idea that was tried in Cork, I think, by Irish distillers and failed miserably because it was uh, operated by a brand. Um, then the Galway Whiskey Trail, I suppose, started to do something, um, which was run by a guy called Cyril Briscoe. Uh, and, or he put it together, which was uh, uh, interesting. And it, 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 it's worked, but it hasn't worked to the same extent. And then Cyril actually helps them in Kilkenny now, and he's brought that same concept over there. And the Kilkenny Whiskey Guild now has really put Kilkenny on the map in terms of, uh, of uh, a destination for Irish whiskey. I haven't been down there recently, but I've, I've heard it's, uh, it's absolutely outstanding. I've been to the Dillon um, many times. I, I, I think it's a great bar. Um, but, you know, Kilkenny is, I suppose it's the spiritual home of Irish whiskey because the earliest recognition of, or the written recognition of Irish whiskey is in the Red Book of Ossery back in 13, I suppose the early, it's 13, they say 1324, but it's 1320 to kind of 1338. Um, and Chris is actually 
he, he's made a a, dis, a a product called Aquavite, which follows that same recipe. But um, Kilkenny is definitely well worth well worth the drive. And if you're a whiskey fan, you'll you'll not be disappointed. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Great whiskey trail, great whiskey guild, and Chris would be happy to show people around and entertain them uh, with Irish whiskey and his own Aquavite. We're going to go uh, back up, up the country a little bit for your next choice. I believe we could we could talk all night about each of these. Uh, and, but yeah. we're going to I'm going to give a tip of the hat here um, uh, to a few bars, actually. Um, first and foremost on the list, this was the last bar on my list, bar number five, uh, is a bar that I've probably spent more money in on whiskey than a- anywhere else. Um, and uh, it's a place that myself and Stephen in the comments there have uh, have spent many uh, a payday in and uh, have, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, talked the night away in, in terms of uh, trying to better our palates and better ourselves um, to, to not much avail, I'm sad to say. Um, but uh, Bose, uh, Bose Lounge, Bose Whiskey Bar uh, on Fleet Street, it's, it's not too far from the Palace Bar, is a very much a hidden gem of Dublin, maybe not so hidden anymore in that one Irish whiskey bar of the year last year. Um, but Bose is one of those bars that you can walk into. It's incredibly small. It's very narrow. It's very rare you get a seat. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those places that it sells an awful lot of whiskey. When I worked in the Celtic whiskey shop, Patsy um, Doyle, who runs Bose, was one of the only guys that was coming into the Celtic whiskey shop and spending a lot of money on whiskey every single month because they were selling an awful lot of whiskey. Um, I'm very much a kind of snob when it comes to whiskey bars. I believe whiskey bars, you know, there's pre- certain prerequisites if you want to kind of consider yourself at the top of the game. You have to, you know, you have to have great whiskey selection. Your staff have to be knowledgeable. You have to have Glen nosing glasses, Glen Cairns or tours. You have to have a whiskey menu. You have to do tasting flights. You have to, you know, you have to really, you know, shout about it. Bose is one of the places that doesn't really shout about it compared to the rest, but they sell a hell of a lot of whiskey, and it's one of the most enjoyable places in Dublin to sell it, to to buy whiskey and to drink whiskey. And it's more often than not, you'll find other whiskey drinkers in there, which is good. And a great pint of Guinness. Uh, a fantastic pint, yeah. I think the Guinness advisor uh, rates it pretty highly, um, but I don't know who listens to him. <laughs> great pint. Um, but there's there's other bars in Dublin as well. You know, um, I'm I'm a big fan of the Bankers Bar on Trinity Street, which is just around the corner from our the Bank on College Green. So not to be confused, the bank itself was an actual bank, um, but the the Bankers around the corner, I think, was where the Bankers drank. And that's a that's a bar owned by a guy called Alan Campbell, a former former uh, LVA president, and he uh, our chairman. He he, he is a real, you know, he's a real passion for Irish whiskey and he believes that people should be promoting Irish whiskey and, and bringing it forward, which is great. Um, and I think he deserves a shout out. And, and back to the sunny southeast there, there's another one or two that I, I've wrote down here. Um, I Actually, I'll go back to Galway first. Sonny Malloy's, I know you've been there, Barry, have you? Absolutely, absolutely amazing bar and there's one just across the road from Sonny Malloy's called Chi Nocton's and Nocton's was the first whiskey bar in Galway and still to this day you can go into Nocton's and get a dram for a price that you'll you'll not believe and it's got numerous little snugs in there and it's amazing uh, but to the sunny southeast there's a bar in Wexford called the Sky in the Ground um, which is just outstanding Johnny Barron has created something that is it's a community within a community within a community everybody wants to drink there I've never actually had a pint there but I feel like I'm already part of the furniture because I've met Johnny so many times and uh, I've heard so much from the from the likes of Pot Stillwell from Stephen from Chris from everybody um, the sky in the ground of Wexford again another guy that's pushing the boundaries um, n- not necessarily you know shouting about it or going out there or telling everybody I'm the best he's very much a laid back guy that runs an absolutely f- fantastic pub um, so, but I know you've so, one left so we'll let well, you go all night on Dublin pubs as well uh, and, and, and Wexford pubs and Waterford pubs and we might come back and visit some of these I know we're getting some questions in the comments here a lot of questions about the various pubs and um, could we create a list of them uh, i'll i'll create oh, yeah. a list of these and i'll put them on stories and sips we might even work on overlaying our map 
of our distilleries at some point yeah. with some of the great spots to hit. But in the meantime, there's just one or two others we want to get through. And then we're going to take some of your questions. And then uh, Sean Scully from Connacilty Distillery has been sitting patiently in the wings, waiting to come on and talk to us about his... Uh, Sorry, his Sean, I, I talk a lot, pal. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, Sean's going to come on and talk to us, but and he'll do that in a few minutes. So thanks for uh, waiting for us, Sean. In the meantime, a couple of others that I want to bring on. Uh, there's one that came up again and again. I've never been there. I think you've been there, Mark, but it came up again and again in the mentions. Uh, so we said we had to include it, and that is going all the way to the West Coast to the beautiful County Clare and a pub called O'Loughlin's in Ballyvaughan in County Clare. And this is a old pub uh, and has some interesting uh, interesting history and interesting story to it. I'm going to put up a picture of it here so people can see what it looks like. This is uh, O'Loughlin's in Ballyvaughan, just what you'd imagine a pub in County Clare to look like. But there's a great whiskey connection there, isn't there? They have, they have a great understanding and knowledge of, uh, of whiskey. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, O'Loughlin's of Ballyvaughan is one of those places that I've actually, I haven't been there, um, but it's one that we've always talked about in, in my circles. And, you know, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of people that are into whiskey and I have a lot of good friends that uh, share my passion for whiskey. And we've all kind of learned off each other over the years. But again, this goes back to the Celtic whiskey shop where we had this little woman uh, coming in uh, from County Clare every couple of months and, you know, looking at the shelves and just picking out things she hadn't seen before and buying them and bringing them down to County Clare to O'Loughlin's and Ballyvaughan. And I think that was, I think her name was Margaret. I'm fairly sure it was Margaret, but she, uh, she was bringing, um, you know, the likes of the Teeling 21s, the Middleton Barry Crockett's, you know, she made sure she had the Jameson Rarest Vintages. She she made sure she had all the premium whiskies that were available and uh, bringing them down there. And, uh, you know, we were telling, we were like, are you selling much of it? And she says, oh, I'll sell a wee bit and that and the other. And I remember her asking me, she says, do you think I should be selling more? And I said, absolutely. And, and we put it, myself and Stephen put a wee price file together for her and she started selling a little bit more. But it, it's one of those things about, I suppose, the community spirit of Irish whiskey where O'Loughlin is constantly mentioned and why it's constantly mentioned is because people that have met her know that she's an absolutely outstanding person she's a lovely woman she's great irish whiskey knowledge she's just genuine and i think that's what makes some irish whiskey bars and irish pubs uh, in general the, the best pubs in the world because there are people there that are really and truly genuine and uh it's one of those bars that i don't think if you, if you put that post up Anywhere in, in Ireland, uh, you know, what's the best Irish whiskey bar? There'd be at least one person that would put up Old Auckland's and Ballyvaughan. Um, it's a true traditional Irish pub, carpets on the floor. You can see it there, the, the bar. It's not Victorian. It's not, you know, it's not fancy in any way. It's just a true Irish pub. And uh, that has to be commended. And, uh, you know, after this is all over, I'm sure this when this pandemic is finished, that uh, it... Uh, you know, we'll probably lose. Uh, I, I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but we'll lose some of these, you know, true, genuine Irish pubs. And um, I can tell you, for one thing, that I hope that Old Auckland's isn't one of them because I, I want the pull up with still there in the next year. The, I'm sure you do too, you know. Uh, Dan Green uh, mentioned that there's a great book from the Dead Rabbit, uh, uh, written by the boys behind Dead Rabbit and Tim Hurley from, uh, from uh, formerly yeah. from Mordew, called Barley to Blarney. Uh, which is a great uh yeah or, and, uh, or, 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 or is mentioned in that book and as are many of the bars that we've talked about uh, and one cool thing about the dead rabbit is you'll actually you'll you'll remember a bar i was talking about at the be beginning the the duke of york and when uh when sean and jack uh who, who i know um and, and i'm glad to be in contact with great guys uh, you know really pushing the boundaries for what irish pubs are and uh, hopefully they get to expand across america the way they do because i I really do think they're they're pulling off uh, Irish pubs to an exceptional standard. But when they first went to New York, they were they had previously been working in the Merchant in Belfast, which is a five star hotel. They had one best cocktail bar in the world. Um, and but when they brought that concept to New York, they wanted to open the best cocktail bar in the world, but they wanted to be an Irish pub, and they based their design and everything that they were doing around the Duke of York, which was the pub that they drank in. 
and in nearly every in nearly every interview and talk that they they give, they talk about Willie Jack and they talk about the Duke of York. But that book, I have that. I actually have. I don't have a hard copy of that book. I was at the launch of it, and I don't know how I lost my hard copy. I think I gave it to Stephen because um, he needed two or three for some reason. Um, but I have it on the Kindle, and I've been using it. I, I, I'm currently working on an Irish whiskey project, and I've been using it as a resource, and it's phenomenal. And Tim Herdy as well. I, I'm sure America is probably sad to have lost him, as he was one of the best and most consistent brand ambassadors over there but th- that book is is well worth the read so siobhan so, mentioned the story of the Irish as a book by kian malloy is not a great one um steve says there's a great show on amazon prime yeah and netflix as well but called the irish pub which is well worth watching yeah fantastic yeah yeah uh, Corinne says that there's plenty of road trips needed to support these places 100 percent. i think yeah. that was the big takeaway from this big long list of pubs that were suggested and if anybody wants to see that list of all of the pubs that were recommended by people around ireland uh, all you have to do is go to uh, my twitter page and, and pin to the top uh, and i put up my uh, twitter profile here but pinned to the top of the page is that list you just have to go to um irish whiskey uh, bc on twitter and you'll find that list and um, there was one more that came out and neither of us had been there neither of us had heard of it but as soon as we saw a mention of this pub we thought <laughs> the way this is described it was worth sharing for no other reason only than maybe a, a little bit of crack and a little bit of a, a little bit of a giggle um, and that is the um maybe some people here know which this which pub this is that is um fitzgibbons in Fermoy in county cork and why i'm sharing fitzgibbons in Fermoy in county cork is because the description that was given of fitzgibbons in Fermoy is so perfect that i think it is uh it's deserving of an honorable mention uh, at best and let me put up a picture here of uh, uh the woman who runs fitzgibbons in Fermoy, and she was called out here in this uh in this uh quote and i will read it out to you it says nula has been behind the bar and i'm assuming this is nula Nula has been behind the bar since it opened in the mid-1700s. She pulls lager like stout, lets it settle halfway, very old-fashioned bar, wireless radio, real fire in the snug, and rarely a TV on. Now, I'm sure Nula has not been behind the bar since the 1700s, but I'm sure she's been there uh, for a while, and it sounds like a fantastic place to go. If you tell me there's a pub without a television, I'm on my way. And if you tell me there's there's a, a, a bar with a, a paddy sign on the window and uh, old cash registers and old fire in the snug, I'm there all day long. So um, that is a real uh, a gem, I think, in Fitzgibbons and Fermoy in County Cork. Um, so if, we, if anyone has been there, let us know. So I'm going to bring, uh, let me bring Mark back in. And if anyone has any questions on uh, pubs in Ireland, let us know. Uh, Mark uh, will probably uh, stick around in the comments answering questions as well. And Mark, uh, for those of you, for those people who do have additional questions for you after you leave our stream, where can they find you to ask you questions about whiskey or Irish pubs? Well, uh, Instagram and Twitter are probably the best places, and you can see my handle there, uh, at Mark underscore Whiskey uh, is the best place to get me. Um, absolutely delighted to chat to anybody that needs any help. Um, obviously, if you send me a PM there, I can give you my email address and can work from there. Uh, but just, just kind of before I go, uh, I suppose, before I finish up, for anybody that out there that's working in the pub trade or has influence in the pub trade or just drinks in great Irish whiskey bars across America or, or across Ireland or anywhere in the world, I think that there's a couple of things that we do in Searson's uh, and that I know I will bring forward um, in all our bars that that I think, you know, these are the standards that you should look for in, in whiskey bars and, and what you should be aspiring to. You should be, obviously, a great whiskey bar should have a decent whiskey selection, you know, and it's it's not hard to do. Um, you know, go to your go to your local provider, go find out who your reps are and, and, and get out there. But understanding the four styles of Irish whiskey, you know, single pot still being unique to Ireland, malted and unmalted barley, you know, single malt, um, understanding grain whiskey and the importance of grain whiskey and understanding blends, understanding why brands that don't have distilleries are important and understanding why bonders which are becoming much more popular now through jj corey and through others the celtic cask program which is, has been amazing and the whiskey bars of ireland why these these bottlings are so important as well is really really good but you know encouraging bars to have tasting glasses have nosing glasses you know encouraging bars to do a tasting flight you know Let's do let's do a tasting flight of four whiskies, a blend, a malt, a grain, and a pot still, you know, bring people, bring them on a journey. And if you really want to bring yourself to the next level, 
start to talk about whiskies in terms of their flavor, in terms of their what what influences they have that are creating the flavors that are there. And if you understand flavor, you you can drink any whiskey in the world and and kind of you know bring yourself to the next level. But when this is all over, I I really can't implore. Um, I, I suppose uh, exaggerate is the right word. This uh, kind of pretense more in that we get a lot of people here in Ireland, especially in the whiskey circles and in the whiskey enthusiast circles that are all sitting at home, sharing, doing bottle shares, selling drams to each other. And they're having a great time. And I respect that. that that's great. But we really, we really know more than ever, we need to see more people getting out and getting into the pubs. You know, it's not about going out and having a wild session. Go out and have a couple of pints and try some of the best whiskies out there. And when you go out somewhere, I just, uh, well, the only thing, the only, I suppose, the only advice I ever give to anybody that wants to learn about whiskey is just try something you haven't tried before. And if there's, nothing, if there's nothing that you haven't tried before, try something that you like, try it again, see if you can get something different. But really, I, I, can't, I can't exaggerate this enough. Get out and drink in the bars. That's um, whether, whether, whether it be in California, whether it be in Ohio, whether it be in New York, whether it be in Dublin, Cork, Kerry, you know, Galway, Belfast, That's just get out, get out and have yourself a dram. You don't need to spend a fortune. Just enjoy the pubs. That's it. So, that's it. Thanks for that, Mark. One of, the, one of the things we're going to do with some of our upcoming tastings at Stories and Sips is uh, we're going to be supporting uh, local bars in Ohio for our Ohio tastings where uh, Ohio bars are allowed to sell uh, small pours of, of liquor uh, together with a meal, and they're going to be preparing samples of the whiskeys to go with a, a meal that we can use in our tasting. So we're going to try and support uh, local bars in Ohio when we do our tasting. So yeah, when this madness ends, I've said this for the last past number of weeks, we're going to do something like charter a plane or get... 100 people from the US and we're going to come over to Ireland and the likes of Mark and Stephen and Siobhan and Ger Garland and Billy Lighton are all going to welcome us at the airport and bring us to their warehouses, their pubs, their retailers and we're going to have a great old time because uh, once Ireland is open up again, we need to celebrate it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Barry, I think I'll knock off, will I? And I'll let you continue on. Uh, Mark, thank uh, you very much. Thanks a million for your time. Uh, there'll be loads of questions in the comments, so feel free to jump into those yeah. comments and answer them. And uh, uh, we'll chat with you later. So thanks a million to Mark McLaughlin, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Uh, that was Mark McLaughlin, uh, who is a tremendous knowledge on whiskey. So I know a lot of you in Ireland know who Mark is. Uh, we're going to move on in a minute or two to chat with Sean Scully, uh, who is joining us uh, on behalf of uh, his family's distillery, Clonakilty Distillery in West Cork. Before we bring Sean on and while we wait for him to do his push-ups and his warm-up, uh, before we bring him on, uh, I want to remind you that uh, uh, every week uh, going forward, every Wednesday on Stories and Sips, we'll be releasing a new podcast episode. So we've moved to an audio uh, episode every Wednesday to go along uh, with uh, our Friday live stream. So we'll be videoing, uh, video streaming like this every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific and midnight in Ireland. And every Wednesday, I'll release a new episode of Stories and Sips on Spotify and iTunes and on storiesandsips.com. And um, I'll be interviewing people who are doing really interesting things in the uh, Irish whiskey world. And this week I had the, the, the pleasure of sitting down and chatting uh, virtually with Grace O'Reilly from Waterford Distillery. And Grace is the uh, agronomist or a crop walker, as she calls herself, uh, in the uh, uh, working for Middleton Distillery, or sorry, not Middleton, but a Waterford Distillery and she has a remarkable job advising farmers on soil type, advising farmers on the, the styles of barley, on sowing uh, time, on harvesting time, uh, an incredible knowledge on the barley component, which is so important, obviously, to uh, Irish whiskey. And I'd love for you to check out that episode. It was a great hour-long conversation. And you can go to storiesandsips.com or your favorite podcast player uh, to catch that episode. We got some great feedback on that from people who are learning about the barley uh, contribution and the importance uh, of what uh, Waterford Distillery are doing. So please go check that out and, and give me some feedback. Uh, next week uh, on Wednesday, we'll be releasing an episode with uh, Eric Ryan. And Eric Ryan uh, uh, works in the Middleton Distillery in County Cork, but Eric is also a uh, part and a founding member of the Cork Whiskey Society. And also on top of that runs the Cork Whiskey Walk. And uh, it is an incredible walk that I had a chance to do last year. Uh, Eric is an incredible knowledge on uh, Irish whiskey. He's an incredible knowledge on um, 
an incredible knowledge on uh, Cork whiskey and Cork history. And we had a fascinating conversation. We talked for about an hour and a half. We'll cut that episode down a little bit uh, to give you some, some great nuggets. Uh, but stay tuned for that. Every Wednesday, we'll have a new episode of uh, Stories and Sips on your favorite podcast player. So now we're moving from Tullamore Dew. I have finished my red breast uh, dream cask in honor of Billy Lighton and his wife's 33rd wedding anniversary. Again, congratulations. And we're now going to bring in Sean Scully, who's going to join us. Sean, you're very welcome. Hi, Barry. How's it going? Going great. Where are you joining us from, Sean? Uh, I'm in Portland, Oregon currently. So it's uh, pretty dull and gloomy over here right now, similar to Ireland. Far from we don't need to start off with, with depressing weather, weather talk now, Sean, at all. Like. No, not at all. <laughs> Um, Sean, you are um, you're from you're from West Cork yourself. You're from Connacilty. I am, yeah. So um, I grew up in a small village called Ardfield. It's about six miles uh, just outside the town of Connacilty. So it's, it's my own family who set the distillery itself. So my dad kind of spearheaded the whole thing. Um, this is idea. Um, my mom runs the whole gin um, aspect of things. She um, was instrumental in put the recipe for that and designing the whole visitor center and all that kind of stuff and still involved uh, day to day. Tell us about Connacilty Distillery for those who have not had the chance to visit, for those who are over here in the States. Um, I had a chance to visit last year, had a wonderful time. Connacilty is a magical place. Tell us about the distillery, its location, and uh, what we should know about it. Uh, yeah, I suppose I kind of have a unique perspective on things being around since um, almost before the idea stage, or well, I, I was there before the idea stage. Um, we kind of realized that we had some unique things at our disposal down at Clannacilty. Uh, we have our own family farm. Um, so we really wanted to tie that into the, the whole, um, whole story about the distillery and all that. It's true to gin. We managed to do that. Um, it's a whey based gin, our minky gin that we make. I know we're talking about whiskey here now. Um, then we kind of realized, you know, we have the land to grow our own grains and we also have the knowledge to grow our own grains. Um, and we also have just a fabulous location. When you when you grow up in Ardfield and you live there your whole life, you kind of almost take it for granted, uh, the beautiful coastline and all that. Um, but you know, most people don't get to grow up in that kind of those kind of areas. And uh, it's a perfect place for growing grains and also for people to come visit. Now, Sean, I know that you are um, the ninth generation uh, of the Scully family to be involved in kind of the farming and, and, and taking care of the land down there. Tell us a little bit about the history uh, going back and, and um, your, your, your connection for so many hundreds of years, right, to, to, to Wet Cork. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's nine generations that we've been, um, we've been on the same farm. So um, same house going the whole way up. Uh, it's been reconverted a few times, but it's the old farmhouse. Um, yeah, so my dad's the eighth generation farmer. He's still... Uh, kind of runs things along with our farm manager. Um, hopefully passed on to myself and my brother will be number nine. But there's a lot of history there. Um, yeah, so we 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 knew we had the knowledge to do things. We're trying to do things different as well at the same time. We're we're um, bringing back some some pre-famine heritage barley. Um, so we're regrowing that. Uh, obtained about you know, a couple handfuls from from Chagisk and which is the Irish the Irish food board basically kind of and uh, growing that out, we've harvested it four times now. We're going to have a very unique heritage kind of whiskey coming out in, let's say, four or five years' time. Um, so, yeah. So, it's the Clannacilty itself is on the Wild Atlantic Way. It's extremely picturesque. You're um, a stone's throw from the water, stone's throw from the, from the harbour, and not, and not far from uh, where, you're, uh, where you're aging the whiskey as well. Um, tell us a, a little bit more about... Um, like why, why, why did you, you, your family get into this and uh, why did they decide then to send you to America? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I almost sent myself to America, Barry. They didn't, they didn't want to let me go. Um, I suppose my dad, my, my dad came up with the idea because he wanted to um, uh, do business locally. He was doing uh, business elsewhere before. Uh, he wanted to kind of um, you know, stop traveling basically, but also provide, you know, bring back to the local community, provide jobs and all that. Um, so it was true these, you know, kind of realization that we have something special going on in Clannacilty and where we are, that we can do something. He saw, he saw a resurgence in the Irish whiskey industry, obviously, and, um, said it's something we can get on board with. So the original plan was to put the distillery, um, on the farm itself. Um, and then we kind of quickly realized, you know, it's a bit off the beaten track, getting 
tourists out there and all that kind of stuff to visit uh, would be a task in itself. So um, that idea passed, and then the, the beautiful uh, uh, building called the Waterfront in Clonakilty, it's bang smack on the World Atlantic Way, became available. Um, it was built to be a bank before the crash happened in 08. Um, so it lay out idle for a couple of years. It was in a, an Irish-speaking whale school. So that's a, for the American listeners, that's a, a primary school where the, the students only speak Irish you know, during class and um, at lunchtime, recess, the whole lot. And then it uh, became available again. And we, we managed to snap it up and um, actually fit the distillery perfectly. We could knock out one wall, um, or sorry, one floor to fit the stills in. And um, we managed to fit a restaurant in there and visitors did a whole lot. Um, and back to your question about Portland, I suppose I I previously studied here. I um, actually worked for a small distillery called Trail Distilling here for like a year or so also. So I kind of knew um, the you know, the layout of the land here. It's a controlled state, so it works a small bit differently. Knew the bartenders, the liquor stores, the whole lot. So um, yeah, it pushed for us to be out here because I knew the kind of uh, the Oregonians would resonate with our story, the whole kind of um, traceability kind of maritime story ties in well and resonates well with people here. So we're going to be tasting two whiskeys. Uh, and it's, first of all, it's good to be talking to another Irish person in America on this because normally I'm either talking man. and a cork man, a fellow cork yeah. man. That's it. We forgot about that connection. As Jer, Jer Garland from Middleton Distillery says, uh, he put up there East Cork versus West Cork. Uh, that's the two of us here today. I suppose yeah. Cove, East Cork, almost East Cork, South Central, we think of it. Um, but yeah, two Cork men. Uh, where you've suggested two whiskeys. Uh, I wanted to showcase uh, to the American audience. I wanted to showcase small, smaller up-and-coming distilleries, makers, producers, uh, brands that are doing interesting things. And I loved what you were doing in Clonakilty. Your dad was very kind in giving me a good portion of his day, showing me around, driving me out to the warehouse, uh, driving me around and, and showing me uh, the sites and the fields. And um, I have a lovely f picture of myself standing in the barley fields in Galley Head, uh, enjoying mm -hmm. the view. Um, there, you, you, tell me the styles of whiskey that you're making right now. And then tell us about the two whiskeys that we're going to try tonight. Yeah, so... Um the whiskies we have in the market right now, so we've, we have a good few options. Obviously, we're um, we're in several places in Europe, uh, in the US, we're right down the east coast for the most part, apart from South Carolina and North Carolina, and then Oregon's the outlier and the west coast. Um, so, the whiskies we have, yeah, so we, our main whiskey here, which we're going to try today, is our double oak finished whiskey. So, that's the core whiskey of all our, uh, all our whiskies. Uh, we also have a port cask finished whiskey. Um, so that's, uh, you know, as it says in the tin, finishing the port cask. Uh, which one should we start tasting? And I'll, I'll, I'll dive into some questions then. What do you recommend of the two? Uh, that we start let's start with the, the double oak. Okay. So this double oak, I believe, recently won a, a prestigious award. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, this is one best blended Irish whiskey uh, at the, uh, with no age statement at the World Whiskey Awards. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, you know, only been in operation for like a year or so. So that was a nice boost for us. Um, at the same time, we won Best New Make. Um, so that's our single pot still, but currently we're making, uh, we're, we have blended whiskeys. We also have a very nice single grain Bordeaux cask finish. So tell me about this particular whiskey. So uh, it is a blended whiskey, single batch, double oak. So what do all of those phrases mean? Yeah, so it's um, so what it is exactly? It's a so it's a nine-year-old grain, and then uh, the malt it ranges between uh, four to eleven years old. Obviously, it differs uh, from batch to batch. Um, so it's aged ex bourbon, and then we finish it off in Virgin American oak to start off with, and then uh, a new cask called a Neoc cask. So N E O C it stands for a uh, New Era of Cask. That, that Neoc cask wasn't something that we had in the in this whiskey originally. First off, it was just the Virgin American oak, but then we found out about the Neoc cask, added it in, and it really transformed the whiskey overall. Um, so yeah, it's a very kind of like vanilla forward whiskey, especially on the nose that you'll get. Almost like fresh cooked grass coming through as well. But then on the palate, I love, so obviously that, that Virgin American oak brings through that vanilla um, up front. The Neoc cask, uh, it's shaved. It's not an STR cast shaved toast to recharge. It's um, it's just shaved and uh, retoasted basically. But it's it's not shaved like you normally shave a cask, like a rotor. 
Um, it's hand shaved with the grain, causes less dust, allows the whiskey to kind of uh, permeate in and out of the, um, the cask a bit easier because those capillaries, are, capillaries aren't blocked. I do get the grass, the, the, the kind of mm -hmm. yellowy straw grass almost on the nose. Yeah, so Jeff wants to know more about the Neoc cask. So the Neoc, it's from France. So we've very, uh, we source our, our, our casks from Alex Sacon in France, and this is something he sells. So it's, um, yeah, it's, they're pretty expensive casks, but, you know, well worth it. Um, they're actually, the staves are a bit thicker as well than normal casks. So again, um, you know, gives you more room for that whiskey to kind of permeate in and out of it. Um, but yeah, we, we found it gave, it gave it those nice kind of toasted almond notes in the palate, hazelnuts, um, and nice kind of peppery, um, almost finished it. So new new era of cask refers more to the style, the, the construction of the cask rather than what it has contained previously. Is it the... The build oh, of the cask. Sorry, it's a it's um it's a Bordeaux red wine cask, ex Bordeaux red wine. Okay. Yeah. And so, so yeah. the Bordeaux uh, red wine was in that cask before you brought it over, shaved it down, uh, toasted it, or charred it again. Is that how it worked? Yeah. So no, we all this is still done in France. So they um it's a yeah ex Bordeaux red wine. Um and then it's hand shaven with the grain, which is important. And then we um they retoast it then uh, lightly. And they retoasted over a long period as well. Thanks to Jesus Nava as well for uh, chiming in there with some uh, description of that as well. Um, I know that the Neoc casks are finding their way into more and more uh, maturation warehouses in Ireland. They wouldn't, uh, they weren't as familiar, I think, over the past number of years, were they? Is this a relatively new uh, approach by distillers and by those maturing whiskey? Yeah, it is. Um, if to the best of my knowledge, I think we were the first people to start using it in the in the Irish whiskey industry anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah, I know a couple of people have kind of started using them since. Um, but you know they're great. As I said, this this whiskey, the um, double oak, used to be uh, just virgin American oak, and it was great as it was. But um, you know we're always striving to kind of make things better as well. Um, so we found out about the Neoc cast. We said, hey, let's let's try this out see if we can kind of elevate this whiskey even more. Um, and it did. And you know, that's what we're going to do with all our whiskeys. You know, it's going to change batch by batch. Um, and, you know, when you win a double gold or best blended Irish whiskey, uh, you know you're doing something well. So then we will stick to that for now. But, you know, that's it. You know, your small distillery, you can kind of play around things like that. And, you know, every, bottle, every batch is going to be small but different as well, which is nice because, you know, you can open up a new bottle of the next batch and be surprised what you're going to get. It's not going to be the exactly the same every single time so, so i see on this one it says that there are 1600 bottles in this particular batch and this is batch number six so there's slight variations depending on the profile that you're you're looking to blend for each batch is that how are you deciding what what becomes a batch? Uh, you know what is a batch um not exactly you know like you know when we like the this was obviously when, you're, when you are a small degree um you know batches can change um, time by time, but uh, what I'm saying is that um, you know we have that flexibility to kind of alter uh, how the whiskies will taste time by time, uh, batch by batch. And this is a blend of grain and malt. Do you, do you do you guys talk about the percentage split between grain and malt typically in the batches? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, 60% grain, 40% malt. I'm pretty sure. But it's a very um, it's a very well-rounded. Um, it's a, a very approachable whiskey, but has a great depth to it as well, in my opinion. Um, There's a spice to it, and and I know it's also bottled at forty three point six percent, so slightly above the forty we're so used to in Ireland. Um, mm. There's a there's a, a, a heat, uh, but a, a complexity of spice that I get on the back of the tongue um, mm. after after a, a minute or two of swishing it around there. Um, which is that from the probably from the malt component as opposed to the, the lighter grain, which kind of comes to the fore early on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but no, yeah, it's at forty three point six percent. Yeah, obviously went for that that ABV, so we don't have to chill filter it. Um, but we're doing some very different things with the, um, you know, obviously we are sourcing the whiskey right now, as I said, trying to do different things with these different cast finishes, but we're doing different things with um, like filtration um, and the way we cut our whiskey. So if you can see in the bottle, we have something called the gentle cut right down there in the label. Um, so that's a process of adding our own water to the whiskey. We use water from uh, from a deep bore well on our family farm 
and uh, that's what we used to cut down the whiskey. Uh, it's pure water. We don't actually we don't filter the water. We don't use RO in the water. Um, but what the gentle cut is is we add that water really really slowly to the whiskey when cutting it down from cast strength. Let's say sixty five percent ish uh, down to the forty three point six percent. We add it over about two to two and a half three weeks. So it slowly kind of brings down that ABV. It allows kind of um, some nice esters to kind of develop over time as opposed to like dumping in the, all the water straight away. And we can afford to do that because we're small uh, or small to medium, I suppose, size distillery. And we can afford to have whiskey sitting in these blending tanks for, you know, that, that couple of weeks, whereas the bigger distilleries uh, don't have, you know, that you know, they obviously have to churn out all the whiskey they can and they can't afford to put it in those blending tanks for that long. Um, filtration wise, we've, we originally, especially with the port cask, which we'll move on to next. Um, originally, this is the first guy we bottled, and uh, we used industry standard six, six to eight mic microns filter. Uh, it stripped away all uh, uh, a lot of the, the, obviously the color was stripped away, and some of the natural character of the whiskey. So we opened up those, those filters to thirty microns, which is a big difference, just enough to catch the char, so you keep that nice color. Um, you keep kind of that natural natural character as well and then in the uh, in the double oak it, it's a lighter color but the color uh it belies the the, the flavor that there's a there's a fruit flavor kind of complexity again i mentioned the back of the, the the tongue that i'm getting that you don't always expect from a whiskey that's necessarily uh lighter in color uh but it's very evident on the on the yeah on the no definitely I, th I think personally i'm no expert in this kind of stuff but i, I do think it that comes down to uh, possibly the gentle cut and allows those kind of those fruity flavors to develop over the time. Um, and obviously, I come back to color. Obviously, without like being said, there's no artificial color or anything like that. So that's how Great. it is. Whiskey as it should be. So, like many distilleries who want to ensure they can keep the lights on until they have their own spirit matured, you're sourcing uh, whiskey currently. Uh, tell us about the whiskey that you're making though right now. So the stills are operational. They have been for more than a year have they is that when they when did you commission yeah it was, it was, yeah march march of last year we um we did our first run so yeah just over a year um so we're focusing on producing single pot still uh we'll see right now so um yeah that's that's going really well obviously we well, as i mentioned earlier we, we won best new make uh best irish new make at the world whiskey awards which we're really proud of so that's good signs um you know it shows that we're doing something well it also reassures anyone who's bought a cask off us so far will hopefully come out with something very nice at the end. But I do hear good uh, things about the, uh, the new make spirit. And I, your, your dad gave me a small bottle, a miniature bottle of the new make, which I have, I drank half it and I yeah. still have half of it left. I maybe have the only new make spirit from Clan Kilty in America, unless you have probably have some yourself. Uh, I think I have, a, I have a tiny drop. It's at 75 or something percent. Yeah. But it's, it's good. You definitely, I, you know, I, I, I struggle to taste new make, you know, it's at that, at, at that um, ABV, but you definitely get that pot still kind of spice behind it. But no, it's, um, we're excited about it. You know, we're growing our own grains, uh, right where you were, you saw the galley and lighthouse and, you know, where it is right perched on the edge of the ocean. Uh, we have our own farm. So we're growing our own grains. We, we use our own, uh, that's where our unmalted barley will come from. And then um, we're going to have this heritage heritage um release whiskey as well upcoming so, so this is the heritage release is if i recall a a grain that you're bringing back um from um uh, from the past that the chagas is a heritage old uh, heritage grain that has not been grown for a while or certainly has not been grown for whiskey distillation if, if i'm right yeah so it's i i don't think anyone's really great anymore just because the yield of this barley isn't isn't great so it's kind of um you know, things have progressed and people are like, hey, there's no point in using this barley. So we, uh, it's, it's Hunter and Goldthorpe are the, the strains of the barley. So yeah, we've, um, as I said earlier on, we, we literally just got a couple of handfuls of it, you know, maybe one or two pounds of Chagisk and we've just grown it out. But it's, um, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we're not sure it's going to yield uh, our taste, but it's just something different we're trying to do. Yeah, it's nice to see that that you have the ability with your own farm, the own land, to be able to to plant something that won't necessarily give you all the yield, perhaps that other more industrial distillery grains would would give you. But you get to try yeah. some new flavor. 
For sure, yeah. And it's like my my dad remembers uh, my granddad put, uh, planting it or sowing it. I'm sorry, my granddad remembers his grand his dad sowing it on the farm when he was younger, uh, which is pretty amazing, you know. And then it just kind of you know went extinct. So we said, you know, as we have the knowledge to grow our own grains. Uh, we have the land, and it's in such a beautiful place. You can, you know, tourists or whoever is visiting can pop out from uh, after the student clinic guilty, drive out to the Galliad Lighthouse where it is, um, and you know, take a walk in the fields. I think we built a new platform out in the fields there a couple of weeks ago, where yeah. you can actually bring out like a you've yeah you, you know that field right on the ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a platform there now. We can you know bring out a drink if you want, sit down. The barley's growing. We we harvested the barley the other day, so it's it's gone right now, but. Um, be sowing it again soon. When I was there last year, I, I, it was still green. Uh, wasn't long after being sown, or yeah, we were early in the summer. I think we were there, uh, so it was still, still, still green and lush. Uh, the the platform is a great idea. I've been nowhere better to yeah. drink a cup of whiskey than sitting in a comfortable chair in a field of barley. Exactly, yeah. But you know, it'd be great to have a distillery out there, is what I said, you know, earlier on. But um, it's pretty hard to get to, so. Um, you know, if someone comes to the distillery and um, they go through and they love what they're doing, you know, we, we talk all about that field and that area in the distillery tour. Um, you know, pretty often they, you know, they're tempted to hop in the car or whatever it may be, uh, head out to the galley head and check it out. And, you know, it's it's great to be able to see that, um, you know, from this is coming from grain to glass, I suppose, you can see it from start to finish. Before uh, the, the craziness of the past few months, uh, how much tourism were you seeing down the wild Atlantic way in terms of an American audience who would stop in American visitors? How, how were the visitors split prior to, prior to the shutdown? Um, so we, we, yeah, we had a lot of Americans come in, uh, obviously the, the British contingent, um, you know, slowed down, um, naturally enough with everything happening over there. Um, a lot of Germans coming over, which is great to see um some french but yeah americans coming over probably was the obviously the irish coming through as well the locals are, are great to support us and come by check us out and spread the word about us um but yeah lots of americans coming through um, way. it's a it's a great tourist destination for many reasons i mean it's you, you can do a great drive there from 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 cork uh, or even yeah fly into cork and then head west Hit Connacilty, then head on down West Coast, down into Kerry, uh, a beautiful, yeah. beautiful part of the world. Uh, we had a great yeah, night. Yeah. Um, we had a great night there last year, uh, just the night before we came to the distillery, actually in Debarras, of course, famous music pub and venue, live live music venue in in, in Connacilty, which has seen uh, many famous Irish musicians go through its doors, Christy Moore and um, uh, Jimmy Crowley, and a lot of Cork legends as well, of course, in Debarras, which is a great old spot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you were doing the, the roundup of the best Irish whiskey bars there earlier on. And um, I think if you did, if you're doing a lineup of best Irish bars, the bars would be right up there at the top. Absolutely. Yeah. Brian says he did. A, he drove the Wild Atlantic Way from Killarney to Galway in 2015 with lunch in Dingle. One of the best days ever. Well, Brian, next time you're going to have to go, instead of going west and north, you'll have to go east uh, to West Cork uh, and to, uh, to East Cork. On the next one and in the uh, next drive you, you do um i like this a lot uh, i uh, do you recommend this served neat do you recommend it served with ice water what's your preferred uh method with this sean uh do you know i i, I drink it neat um always um you know i throw it in cocktails sometimes as well just to mess around with it but i always say you know whatever you want to do with the whiskey um you know work away if you like your whiskey on ice uh, drink it that way don't tell any don't let anyone tell you how to drink your whiskey if you don't it's up to you. You know what you like. Um, yeah, maybe a drop of water in there will open it up as well. Um, but yeah, do whatever you want with it. But yeah, and, and I, any way you like to drink whiskey, you're right. Uh, Debarras is on John's list, his must visit list. And then William, uh, who's a great whiskey, Irish whiskey fan, said he was in the distillery in June and he met you, Sean, in, in the, the palace the day before. And uh, your father looked after, looked after William. Hi, William. How's it going? <laughs> Um, let me see. Um, Damien says the barley fields of Clannacilty are a sight to see. Beautiful. Look across the water and next stop, North America. 100%. So the next whiskey that we're going to try then uh, is the Clannacilty port cask finish. And I believe this one, this is one of the first ones you released, wasn't it? Yeah. So we kind of released, um, yeah, we released both these whiskeys uh, pretty much simultaneously. 
So um, yeah, these were our first first whiskies off the block. And then in behind that, we brought in our single grain Bordeaux cask, which uh, was originally like a, um, a distiller exclusive, um, just out of the gift shop. And it was selling well, so we decided to release that then uh, on the general market. So those are the three whiskies that we have kind of running the States right now. We also have some um, brewery collaborations, which we'll probably speak of or talk about after this, possibly. So this is a different color. There's a, a pink tinge to this that's not evident in the double oak. Tell us about the difference in maturation of this and maybe the, the grain makeup of this one. Yeah, so it's it's pretty much it's the same grain makeup. Um, there's 60% grain, 40% malt. Um, but it's um, yeah, it's it's finished in a port cask for about three to five months. So again, this goes back to the kind of whole batch basis that um, you know every batch might differ slightly. Um, more so in the in how long each cask is aged, three to five months, because different because uh, casks age at different rates, obviously. So Paul, our head distiller, will taste uh, from the cask and decide when it's good to go. Uh, we didn't want to keep it in the casks for maturing any longer than that, really. Um, we didn't want it to be overly kind of port influenced, overly rich. So that's that's why we kind of kept in there in that kind of middle range. But yeah, it's, um, sweetness on the nose, isn't there? Yeah, no, there definitely is, and that's you know it comes down to those dark fruits, which are obviously evident from the port cask. But it's um, you know it's a very easy drinking whiskey. Yeah, so you got like cherries, raisins on the palate from it. Nice kind of wood spice finish to it as well, which is nice. There's a, oh, there is a wood spice to it. There's a, um, oh, what, what wood would I name that? It'll come to me. It's not oak, it's something else. It's, there's a, it's almost like a, like a nice old chest in your, in your grandmother's, uh, in your grandmother's house. <laughs> I'll be looking through on that, yeah. The, and this is aged in, so the port, Port pipes or port casks. Uh, this is finished in, and you finish this in Clonakilty in your warehouses. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, all our whiskey is finished in our warehouse. Um, it's on the family farm out in Ardfield, so right out there on the coast again. Um, so it's a pretty amazing place. Um, you know, the actual warehouse itself is literally uh, perched right on the cliff, um, overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. I think we've the closest maturation warehouse to the ocean in all of Ireland. So it's um you know more so far in New Mexico spirit and stuff. We're really hoping that kind of that sea mist sea air that kind of bombards that warehouse um day by day will um affect the casks and the whiskey as it you know as it matures. So it'll be pretty unique to see how it comes out. Uh, we had a great day uh, visiting the warehouse and and um opening up some of those casks and um yeah, like your your bet is that that maritime proximity is going to lend a maturation style or kind of a, a flavor profile that wouldn't be present if that maturation warehouse was more inland, obviously. Yeah, definitely. You might have like a small bit of kind of like brininess to the whiskey. Again, it's it's really tough to say how how much this will actually affect um the new mix spirit, but it's um you know, it definitely will affect it, and also because those grains that we're using are, are grown so close to the coast as well. Um, two and both of them combined, combined should make a difference to the whiskey. You know, it's a great place to you know visit as well. You know, we'll bring people up there like yourself um, to see the whole place. And I don't know what what kind of day it was when you were there, but it can get pretty rough during the winters. Oh, it was a beautiful day, and we were there. Very lucky. Very so lucky. Yin and yang. It's, that's that's right. Happening. Asher says Cork, we know ourselves, you could be lucky, you could be unlucky with the weather. Um, yeah, yeah. Brian hit the, the note on the head, it's a cedar, there's a cedar uh, profile that's a uh, flavor that's coming to me on the, on the palate uh, with this, but there's a beautiful evolving uh, dark fruit sweetness, um, chewy sweetness that's coming clearly from that, that port contribution. Yeah, definitely, there's a real nice kind of viscosity to this guy. Mm. William says that when things are back in order, he'll see if he can do this one for the whiskey club that he's part of, which would be great in the, in McMullen's, I believe, in, in Nevada. Um, Peter says asks, how easy is it to emigrate to Ireland from the US? All this talk of uh, <laughs> green barley fields and uh, platforms and distilleries. From Ireland to the US, uh, it's not very not very easy, to be honest. It um, took me a while. I spent, I spent a year, um, so I... 
as a, well, I worked for a distillery here in Portland, went home for a small bit, and my aim was always to kind of come back here, but working for uh, Tlana Kilty. I spent a year up in Dublin um, waiting to get my visa, waiting to get my interview patiently. Um, so um, I kind of was the first brand ambassador for a distillery up in Dublin during that time. Uh, and then luckily got my visa, I have a five year visa, and plan to stay here in Portland for a while and um, spread the good word up the, the west coast of America. Portland's a lovely part of the world. I read that first comment as how easy is, is it to immigrate to, to um, oh, is it, yeah, to, to Ireland? Ireland. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ireland. Oh, geez, it's a lot easier to go to Ireland than <laughs> to Ireland and the other way around. Right. Yeah. What's the uh, the name of the, um, there's a great whiskey bar in Portland, the Scotch, uh, Scotch, Scotch Lodge. Scotch Lodge, that's it. Yeah, great yeah, whiskey yeah. bar. No, well, it's, Portland's amazing. You know, it's, um, it's, you know, obviously you were here a couple of months ago, aren't you, Barry? I was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, there's, you know, some great whiskey bars, great cocktail scene. Obviously, it's known for its brewery scene um, as well. But people kind of appreciate, you know, craft a lot, and they like the story behind things. Um, you know, they love the story of our way-based gin um, and all that kind of stuff. They love the kind of old family aspect behind things as well. So it's a perfect place for us, and it's going well. And the weather is uh, not too dissimilar from West Cork, is it? No, it's not, you know what, but I like that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to survive down in California, uh, where you are right now, um, I'd burn up, so I'm, I'm happy with the, the kind of muggy weather here. Yeah, the, the cork complexion would go from purple to, it only goes from purple to white, we don't tan very well. Um, yeah, when I was in Portland, I visited one of the largest whiskey bars in the world, the Multnomah Whiskey Library, uh, which is a fantastic mm. place unbelievable selection uh in fact i had two cork whiskies there i had conakilty and i had west cork uh the fillers uh whiskey in the Multnomah whiskey library which is an amazing I, spot did you have to wait a while to get in there or? you know i walked in i know you have to reserve well in advance um i just walked in randomly at a four o'clock the, the minute they opened and they sat me at the bar and uh, within i'd say 20 minutes the place was full and if i if i'd been a minute later i wouldn't have got in the door yeah, I know it's a good spot, but that's that's what you have to do you have to get there at four o'clock. Jerry Garland, uh, who is an oracle of knowledge, and I thought just all things whiskey, and I didn't give him enough credit. He's an oracle and all things historic now as well. Uh, a state he's always wanted to visit. I presume he's referring to Oregon. Big connection with Ireland. Your first governor was the man that gave the Republic of Ireland its flag. Uh, that may not be Oregon. Maybe there's an in, maybe there's a conversation happening within the threads here, uh, possibly. Uh, Jer, maybe you might uh, clarify that for us. Uh, but there are a lot of Irish and American connections, no doubt, um, going way back to the, the Civil War. Uh, so you're right now you've got these, uh, these are two of the products that are out there, but I know that you've started to do collaborations with uh, breweries in the United States. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now, and then we'll talk about something exciting that you're about to do as well. Yeah, so um, Damien, Damien Cashman, who's listening right now, uh, or is listen to the chat. Um, so he kind of came up with this idea, I suppose he, he's very good. He's, um, he represents us in uh, the Northeast of America. Uh, he is very good friends with the guys at um, New England Brewing Company, um, so Nedco. And um, they wanted to you know, kind of collaborate and come up with this, um, this beer finished whiskey. So what we did first of all was we, um, we sent over some of their ex Fuzzy Duck IPA casks. So that's a, it's a hazy IPA to Ireland sent over about three or four of those casks uh, last year. Uh, we fill our whiskey up in those casks at that, that Atlantic Ocean warehouse. And then we uh, you know, slap a nice new label with the, uh, the brewery's logo on it. And uh, we send it back to that respective state. So that's what we're trying to do kind of in a lot of these states um, here in America. Every, we're trying to do it in every state that we're in. So again, that kind of consists of um, you know, most of the East Coast and Oregon. Um, in just for people listening, obviously people are all, are spread out all over the place. So we're with uh, Nebco, New England Brewing Company in uh, Connecticut. We're with um, what's it called? I had the list here. Um, Roy Pitts in Pennsylvania, Manor Hill, Maryland. Um, we're with Twenty Six Degrees in Florida, and then uh, Revival Brewing in. Um, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. But we're releasing, um, Damien's coming out with a new um, Imperial Stout Trooper whiskey in Connecticut um, early next week. So we're, um, yeah, we're releasing that. It's 
that there it is now. Um, our head distiller, Paul, uh, came out and said that this is probably the best whiskey that we've come out with uh, from the distillery so far. So it's going to be a, you know, our first kind of stout finished whiskey, um, and it's pretty exciting stuff. So yeah, keep an eye out for that in Connecticut. I know it's going to do a live stream. I think it's on the 1st of May um, on that Facebook page. So keep an eye out for that. And, so um, what's this is a stout aged, a stout finished, this this particular? Yeah, uh, so, that's, so that's their, um, yeah, Imperial Stout. Uh, so it's an Imperial Stout Trooper kind of has a you know Star Wars team behind it. But I've I've tried the beer itself and it's it's amazing. Um, you know, real kind of nice uh, creamy stout. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's a milk stout, but it has that kind of um, nice creamy mouthfeel to it. When when you release these um, these local expressions uh, as collaborations, and I know the likes of Irish distillers who do their hyper local cask mates, and, and uh, they release those pretty much just in that area for sale in that particular state. Perhaps is that what you're doing as well? That those are just available at the brewery, is it, or do, do they go further afield? Um, you know, for the most part, they're they're in their um, in their respective states. Uh, I know we might be holding a few back there. If, if there's anyone watching Ireland, we might be holding a few of them back in Ireland for sale. So keep an eye out for that. Um, you know, something with some bigger breweries. Um, I haven't really talked about this yet, but uh, to anyone watching in Oregon, we're we're pairing up with um, Pelican Brewing. So this is the new label, um, small bit of an exclusive uh, for you, Barry. Ah. Uh, they are a, a brewery here in Oregon. I don't know if you got out to the coast when you were here, but they, um, yeah, they're a coastal brewery. So very much kind of the same brand story as us. Um, you know, bang smack on the beach. Their their slogan is "Born at the Beach." And um, so, you know, literally, if you put pictures of Pelican Brewery in Pacific City, and um, you put uh, Clonakilty side by side or Ardfield, you know, it's you know match they both basically look the both, uh, exact same so it's a it's a it's a good match for both of us um that's a, a their mother of all storms cask so it's a it's an english barley wine so it's um it's pretty unique stuff it's a um should have a nice kind of toffee aspect to it okay um do those ever those don't ever make their way to ireland do they for sale they're they're just us releases no, so so we'll set we'll, everything's obviously bottled in Ireland and the whole lot. Um, those casks are shipped over to Ireland and all that. So it's aged, uh, obviously aged in Ireland, bottled in Ireland. Um, the first release with the the Nebco, the fuzzy duck finish, we didn't keep any in Ireland, and then we said, you know, why not? So we're we're keeping a couple of casks behind or cases behind um, from now on of each release, and you know, uh, I'm sure they'll sell out pretty fast. So you have to be on your toes to snap up a bottle or two. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to keep some behind for the Irish market because why not? Nice. And I know we um, you're kind enough to give us uh, some some bottles. Uh, you're, we're going to do a, a gift or a kind of a contest. We're going to run uh, uh, starting perhaps tomorrow in our Facebook group, uh, which is Irish Whiskey Fans of America. For those of you who haven't yet joined uh, that Facebook group, I recommend that you do. Uh, we are now over 4,100 uh, Irish Whiskey Fans across America. It's growing every day. We are having amazing conversations in there, but Conor Kilty, you're going to uh, do a, a giveaway for, for our members in there. If you haven't joined, uh, do go to do a search for Irish Whiskey Fans on Facebook, uh, and we'll uh, we'll have a really great uh, giveaway from the, the kind uh, folks at uh, Conor Kilty Distillery. Um, Sean, you've talked about these um, more immediate releases. You've talked about the pot still that's being um, distilled right now. What's the goal in the long term in terms of the style of whiskey that you want to be known for um, in Connacilty? Will you blend going forward? Will you just release pot stills? What's the what's the ultimate aspiration? Uh, I think we're going to focus heavily on pot stills, um, just because you know, you know we feel like that's the the creme de la creme of Irish whiskey. Um, that's not to say anything about blends. I think we we will re uh, keep releasing some blends, um, but. You know, our main focus and we hope to be known for our um our single postulates in the future and you know we've made, it, we've made a good start to it with the winning those awards and stuff like that and that's a credit to um paul pedro uh rich all our distillers uh back in town so um you know we've, we're pretty confident we can come out with something pretty, pretty special in the end a few years away yet though from releasing anything um from the from your own stills obviously yeah yeah, yeah. we're gonna 
Uh, we won't release three three year old. I'd say. Um, don't hold me to that now, but I think we're going to release wait at least four or five, um, maybe even longer years. Uh, try to come out with the best stuff um, we can up front. Nice. How how long more will you stay in the states? Are are you going to stay there for good? Have you? Um, what's the connection? Is there an ongoing connection beyond Conor Kilty now to the states? Um, yeah, there's an ongoing connection beyond Conor Kilty to the states for sure. So I I suppose I'll get it. Um, I have to mention my girlfriend out here. So that's the reason why I came back. I suppose um, I have a five year visa. Always yeah. yeah, that's what happens, isn't it? Um, so I yeah, I have a five year visa out here. Um, I plan to stay for five years. I know um, that my family will definitely want me back after the five years. So we'll see. You know, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. So who's who's to say what I'll be doing in five years? I know. Yeah, it's hard enough to plan for Tuesday or Wednesday, like let alone five years at this stage. Exactly. And I'm constantly asked, what, the, what's, what am I going to be doing? So um, I have no idea. What's the five-year plan? What's the plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know um, one thing I knew, I'll, I'll still be involved with the distillery. Um, you know, whether it be uh, over here or um, at home, um, you know, either way, it's going to be great. Um, Tim McKee has a question. Any chance the Armagnac finish will be released outside of Florida? He loves that stuff. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm pretty sure you can buy. So the Armagnac finish is, um, it's a Primo. So there's a, a liquor store in Florida called uh, Primo Liqueurs. Um, so that's like an uh, exclusive bottling we did for those. So it's a, um, an Armagnac finish, um, again, has their kind of, you know, their, their logo on it, the whole lot. Um, Tim, I think you can buy that um, on our website. You go to, I think it's shopclonakilty.com or just go through our regular website to, to the, buy, the buy kind of um, area and website and you can you can pick that up. We ship to 43 different states. Um, we're in liquor stores in 12 states. So yeah, um, I'm sure you can get your, your hands in it somehow. Um, but that's something different we're trying to do as well. We're we're doing these um, cask sales, different you know premises, whether it be like a liquor store, our chain liquor stores are like a whiskey club. We've allocated um, we've allocated a cask of our 15 year old malts, which we which we sourced and still in the warehouse now aging um, to each state. So um, if there if you're interested in that in a certain state, we'll fly you over to Ireland. Um, you know you can taste all the cask from all the casks, decide which one is to your taste, and you know that's that can be your cask. Um, show your own logo on it the whole lot. So that's that's one one per state, and it's um yeah that's that uh, should be a pretty nice malt whiskey. It's great to see another Cork distillery having opened. Now there's three distilleries in Cork. There's one beat you by about 195 years. That's the Middleton Distillery, of course, in Cork. And you had the West Cork Distillers um, a few years before yourselves, and then now uh, you're the the latest uh, to to open. Um, wonderful to see distilling returning to Cork in in smaller craft ways. Um, and now West Cork distillers, of course, are growing and growing and growing, and the hope would be that you 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 do the same. Um, but yeah, there's a there's an element of pride. All right, it'll be hard for me to hide it that Cork is uh, is is punching big again in terms of distilling. Not not afraid yeah. to, to go global again. No, not at all. You know, us Cork folk are we're very proud of where we're from. You know, we've Just a bit no there. problem gloating about it. So I think that's a good trade as well, being proud of where you're from and. Um, whether it be from up by the city or down by Ardfield, um, where I'm from, you know, I think it always, Cork will always hold a special place in our heart. That will, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, and sure, when we, uh, again, when, when this madness ends, we'll have to put Clannacilty on the uh, on the list of uh, bringing, bringing Americans over and do, do some yeah, tours. Yeah, so we'll, give you, we'll give you the whole tour, we'll send you out to the fields, we'll put you all in, we'll give you nice reclining chairs out in the, the barley fields on that platform and the whole lot, so... We'll take care of you. No, no, no better place. That's where we want to be. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing these two whiskeys. I really love this uh, podcast finish. I had it uh, when I visited last year, uh, and I, I love the fruit. There's a chewiness to it. I love that red, uh, almost like a stone fruit that, uh, on, on the back of the palate that is really, really um, candy-like. 
and, and tastes of more. And I can't get enough of it. So I really appreciate you sharing these. And I know there's great conversations happening in the comments, people looking to find where they can buy these. And I know there's some kind of guilty uh, folks ha handling and managing some of those comments as well. If anybody's got any more comments or questions for Sean, feel free to put them into the uh, into the comments here, or I'm sure we'll stick around for a little bit afterwards to answer any questions uh, you might have. So, um, what would if you wanted people to know one thing, Sean, about Clonakilty, be it the town, the distillery, the whiskey, you wanted people to connect somehow with with Clonakilty. What would you tell them? Uh, what would you tell them about? Uh, do you know what? I've got, I've gone through it all. Um, I think I really do think we have a beautiful distillery. Um, you know, set up uh, in Clonakilty. Uh, state of the art, you know, my my mom put a lot of effort and everyone did into designing the whole place. Um, you know, so I know whoever's visited will will say the same. So we have the whole gift shop, the whole visitor experience, an active distillery. They can come visit, um, you know, walk into the where the distilling happens and it's piping hot. You'd be sweating in two minutes. Um, but it's it's an experience. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I mean, you just have to come and see it by yourself. Um, you know, come out to the distillery, do the whole tour, head out to the galley head lighthouse afterwards, check out where we're we're going our grains. If you're if you're lucky, we'll bring you up to the the warehouse afterwards, like you did, Barry. Um, That's right. And uh, yeah, just just come see us. Um, I can attest to the beauty of the distillery. You'd be, I'd be, su I'm surprised to learn that it wasn't purpose built. That you were able to take over a, a building that was practically. Uh, designed for for its ultimate use uh, and it's a magnificent glass facade overlooking the town right there in the roundabout you can't miss it uh, and the light coming in off those copper stills is something beautiful and uh it, it is a pure cork experience too there's a there's a little warm it warms my heart to the, the old cork the cork accent touring me around you know you're in safe hands um, yeah we, we're the scotsman there as well now so um, oh yeah we, we, we leave him off uh, yeah <laughs> Um, Jeff said, uh, oh yeah, you might leave Cork, but Cork never leaves you. That's it. That's exactly right. Uh, William said he's just gone to your site and ordered one of everything. Steve wants to know the cost of a cask. We're not going to go into the cost of things um, I, only because I do believe that that's a violation of Facebook's terms. Uh, so we're not going to sell anything or direct people anywhere. Steve, I'm sure you can find Kind of Kilty online and, and reach out and ask any questions there. I'm conscious of the challenges of liquor liquor sales and live streams. Um, yeah, but yeah. We we just launched um, a U.S. Facebook page, so it's Clonakilty Distillery USA. Uh, go give that a follow, uh, shoot us a message, and we can help you out in any way. Um, and yeah, as I said, well, thanks, William, for purchasing those bottles. We um, just go to our online shop um, if you can't find it in your state. Um, right. But if you're on the East Coast, you should be able to find your liquor stores, unless you're in South Carolina and North Carolina, and if you're in Oregon, um, it's here as well. So um, stay uh, keep, uh, stay tuned or keep an eye out in the Facebook group over the next few days as we launch our Clonic uh, giveaway. Uh, and uh, there's some, some good prizes. We won't share what they are yet, but we'll do that in the Facebook group over the next day or two. Uh, Sean, thanks a million. Really thrilled that you could join. Uh, great to get a bit of a Cork chat going on a Friday evening. Where, where would you be? Um, love it. Uh, it makes me miss Cork. It makes me, makes me miss the likes of Debarras. I want to get back there as soon as we possibly can. Um, so um, fair play for, for rolling out the whiskies. Excited to see what's coming for Clonic Hilti, and I hope lots of people reach out to you with questions, uh, but I'll let you get back to enjoying the dreary weather conditions of Portland, Oregon, and uh, enjoying the rest of your weekend. Perfect. Cheers, Barry. Thanks for having me, and be sure Sean. to stop by the distillery again when you're back in Ireland. Absolutely will. Fair play. Thanks a million, Sean. That was uh, the gentleman that is Sean Scully from Clonakilty Distillery. Uh, thrilled to be able to bring people on the live stream and have an old chat, um, if nothing else, for my own sanity and keep me uh, enjoying um, my time in isolation by at least uh, breaking the monotony with a few good conversations about whiskey. Uh, and we've got some great uh, guests lined up over the coming weeks as well. Uh, I'm all about trying to showcase both smaller distilleries and smaller brands and up-and-coming uh, whiskey companies, uh, as well as people doing interesting things in the whiskey world. So our podcast every Wednesday is an interview with um, those people who are doing things that are interesting, different, uh, advancing Irish whiskey, or helping bring people together through Irish whiskey. Uh, those conversations happen every Wednesday on our podcast on Stories and Sips. Uh, next week on the live stream, we're going to have uh, two, uh, two guests who are going to be joining us. Um, we are going to start the evening with a really incredible uh, deep dive into uh, almost molecular cocktail making with old Irish whiskey. 
uh, which is going to be really interesting. And I'm not going to give too much away right now, but I'm just going to tell you that there's somebody in America doing really, really interesting things with Irish whiskey by pairing old um, styles of Irish whiskey, uh, by um, finding old Irish recipes for drinks and for cocktails, and then having them meet a little bit of science and a little bit of uh, molecular gastronomy to use a better term for it uh, and, and he's going to showcase some uh, some great things with us on next week's live stream i'm also going to have the founder of a small new whiskey company that has just launched called bua bua irish whiskey which just launched in the state of ohio and uh, launching further afield very soon um uh, we're going to have martin and uh, who is the founder of of bua co-founder of bua uh, joining us and martin is a former tullamore dew ambassador in the united states who's gone on to start his own whiskey company uh, and, and a bottle of bua is on the way to me to uh, sample and taste and and, and see what so see what we think uh, but he'll be joining us so it should be a good old conversation so um get your questions ready for for martin and uh We'll share more of those details of what's upcoming over the coming week in the Facebook group and the Facebook page. Uh, so for those of you who uh, are, have just joined, we're at the tail end of our two-hour marathon session on a Friday. We've had amazing guests. We've had Mark McLaughlin, who entertained us, and I'm, I'm sure we could have talked for two weeks about Irish pubs. We might have to come back and talk more about it. And then we had Sean Scully from Connacilty uh, Distillery, uh, of course, in County Cork. Um, for those of you who do want to catch up on the podcast that we released on Wednesday with Grace O'Reilly, the crop walker, the agronomist from uh, Waterford Distillery, you can, you can check out that episode on storiesandsips.com. It's getting a great reaction. I'm delighted because it's Grace that's getting the great reaction. Of course, not me. It's uh, I'm only the, the person turning on the microphone. Uh, the interesting guests are doing uh, the, the, the work of sharing interesting stories. My next guest on Wednesday's podcast is Eric Ryan. Eric Ryan is the founder of the Cork Whiskey Walk in Ireland. He is a distiller in Middleton Distillery. He is a founding member of the Cork Whiskey Society. He is a whiskey collector. He is a whiskey fan. He is a student of Irish whiskey history. And we talked for a long time during the week and I recorded that episode and I'm going to release that on Wednesday. I'm fascinated by the history of Cork whiskey. I'm fascinated by the interest by the the rise and fall of whiskey i'm interested in in cork and of course the greater island of ireland and the parallels between whiskey and kind of the socioeconomic changes that happened in ireland over the years amazing cyclical nature of irish whiskey uh, as seen through cork distilleries particularly uh, and and interesting to see the middleton distillery being uh, the survivor throughout the 200 turbulent years of consolidation and of amalgamations through the years so we're gonna have a, a really great conversation so um i know there's some folks here like the jer garland and billy lighton from from uh, irish distillers who i'm sure you'll find some of that interesting as well and thank you all for joining so um, thank you all again for joining in. I really appreciate appreciate your company. Uh, it's it's you are doing the favor to me by turning up and allowing me to have a chat and express my interest and my passion for whiskey. Um, as I always say, I'm no whiskey expert, but I'm an enthusiast and I have a passion like the rest of you. And I'll bring on smarter people than me to help me understand uh, the differences in whiskeys and uh, share uh, maybe stories with people who are doing really interesting things. Uh, so check out the podcast, go to storiesandsips.com, find us in the Facebook group. I'd love for you to join, whether you're in Ireland or further afield. Uh, it's not just for um, fans, uh, Irish whiskey fans in America. Anybody can join it. It is a predominantly American audience, as it always will be. But you're, you're welcome to come in and, and join there anytime. And I'd love to uh, I'd love to see you in their great, great conversations that we're having. So uh, it is a Friday evening. I'm going to go have some dinner. Uh, I wish you all a safe weekend. I hope you stay safe, stay at home as much as you possibly can, and I hope to find you all back here again next Friday. Do me a favor and share this. Uh, share this with your friends, with your family, so that we can build the audience of, and the community who comes together to end isolation and so that they don't have to drink alone and they can cut through the monotony and struggles and stress of a week by opening a glass of whiskey and drinking it among friends. That's all we're here to do. Sláinte, everybody. Until next week. <laughs>